and gentlemen to the Court Marshall Podcast, the podcast made by wrestling fans for wrestling fans. And all we do is leave an impression. You may call us the people who make marks on the wrestling industry and the journalism industry. I am your colonial champion, Sean McCarty, ready to bring you all of the discussion regarding Bad Blood 2024, the reemergence of Hell in a Cell. On the anniversary of Hell in a Cell itself, but I cannot do it alone. Because with me, by my side, as always, the man of the hour, the man with the power. He is too sweet to be sour. He is the Bay Area Brawler himself, the master of math and subtraction, addition and division. But he's not here to divide because his charm will unite us all. Skylar Greenberg, how you doing, buddy? Are you saying the math stuff because Scott Steiner was in attendance and you want to do a Scott Steiner math promo? Well, there. Well, currently, Skylar, I've only talked about sixty-six and two-thirds of this podcast. And when you oh, look, bullshit. Bullshit. <laughs> if you look at the third man in this podcast and you think that it's in balance, then I'm here to tell you that that's not true. Because here tonight yeah. at Bad Blood, I am introducing the third man. The man who has a 133rd and 6 ninths chance of doing improper fractions himself. It is the master of TAW Gaming and the proprietor of the once glorious South Kakalaki Championship Grassling. Josh again, how you doing, buddy? He's fat! Uh, my name is Josh again. Welcome to the Totally Awesome Podcast. Once again, this is a simulcast. We're talking about WWE Bad Blood. I'm Josh again. He's Sean. He's also Skyler. Uh, we're having fun today, and but before we get into Bad Blood, we also have some other things we want to talk about. Isn't that right? Yeah, we have yeah because when you add Samoa Joe to the mix, your chance of winning drastically go down. <laughs> <laughs> well, unfortunately, I would love to see Samoa Joe, but as far as I know, we hardly get the chance to anymore, even though he should be getting paid royally because this company just got paid royally, but I'm not going to be the one to bring it up because it's not my segment. It's this man's segment. Roll that intro. Coming straight to you from the Golden Gate Garage, this is the Wrestle News with Skylar Green. Yeah, the news of the week, the Bay Area Brawler, bringing it to you, the news, to tell you what's going on. And boy, did AEW do a swindle. <laughs> they picked up a big old bundle, as Warner Brothers Discovery has proven to once again not know where the priorities are as far as quality programming is concerned. But why don't you break it down for us? Or uh, You don't have to go into excruciating detail. But it looks like well, AEW, the cancerous tumor, is sticking around for a while longer. Sean, any detail about this he gives us is going to be excruciating. Dep the length of the detail is irrelevant. Well, well here's, here's the thing. Here's the thing, though, about the detail is that AEW is a really big pain in the ass when it comes to the details. So here's the thing: because WWE is a stockholder company, they have to report their financial earnings and they have to report the details of their stuff. Because AEW is a private company, they can keep everything private as long as they want to. So we really get no information about what the hell AEW is doing, in all honesty, okay? What I have gathered is from what others have reported and also my own research. But let me be 100% right now, I don't know what the hell this deal is, okay? Because well, some of the details and some of the numbers deep. are really stupid. Yeah, and sadly, I feel like they're probably stupid and accurate given the way that Warner Discovery with its stock has been behaving. Yep. So let's break it down. Now, we cannot talk about the current deal without talking about the old deal. Okay? So let's rewind the clock back to 2020. Do you know how much money they were getting for the old deal? Elucidate for us, Skyler. It was $50 million a year for four years. And basically, the understanding that we have with the old deal was that as part of it, Warner Brothers had a small stake in AEW. They also had the number of shows increase, but they've always kept it at like two or three aired shows, which sure. are Dynamite, 
Rampage and Collision. Right. Now, instead of going from $50 million a year, they're going to $150 million a year or $170 million a year or $175 million a year or $185 million a year because all the different sources have been giving different numbers. Either way, that is a, a bit of a hefty increase for not much return on investment, in my well, humble opinion. And what opinion. I've come to understand myself from what I've read is that if this is a three-year deal with a fourth-year option, where if they pick up that fourth-year option, it will also add a what has been called a significant increase to that number. But the problem is that we don't know what that number is, and all these different numbers are coming from different guys, whether it's Sean Ross Sapp from Fightful Select or SES or Uncle Dave Dean. Melter, who, by yeah. the way, reported the highest number at 185. Well, and that the good thing about that is you can still taste Tony Khan's ass cheeks from Dave's mouth when he says that. So chances are that's the closest to Tony Khan's opinion that we're going to get. Right. My understanding is that the deal is somewhere around 170 and 175 with the option for bonuses. But that's what let, let's get to the other details. So the details of this is that they're going to be having two TV shows, Dynamite, which is going to remain on TNT and Collision, which is going to remain on TBS. Rampage is being dropped. Oh no! Oh, uh, but um, but but that was AEW's equivalent of SmackDown. I how could yeah. this be? How could this happen to me? Yes, I've I made my mistakes. People who were interested in that show must be real disappointed. Right now, AEW, in exchange for this, will have their pay per views move from Bleacher Report, which by the way is shut down, to Max starting in twenty twenty five. However, have you heard the details about this pay-per-view subscription thing? So, basically, the idea that I've come to infer, and correct me if I'm wrong, Sky, is that basically HBO Max doesn't really have the pay-per-view format to stream live set up yet. So, they're basically banking on AEW being something of the guinea pig to craft it. Because they give a very vague timeline as to, at some point, we're going to have all of these pay-per-views run live. And at this point in the future, in 2025, we're going to do this and this and this. So a lot of this is rooted in theoreticals as HBO Max has been desperate to grab subscribers and has really fallen behind in the streaming service game. Right, because ultimately, and here's the thing, I used to have HBO Max. Same. And it was fine, but then I'm like, you know what, I'm paying a lot of money for something I'm not really using. I'ma just cancel it. Like, I use Peacock for the WWE shows and occasionally a couple of other ones. But honestly, like, besides Peacock and ESPN Plus, which I get for free, and Hulu, which I also get for free as part of my package with Verizon, I don't use the streaming that much. So HBO was an easy cut. I had HBO Max for like a month, and that's just because I wanted to see the Snyder Cut of the Justice League. And the other thing, too, is that HBO Max also tried to, like, to, they tried to diversify themselves too much in a fast amount of time. So they tried to be like, hey, we're also going to be a hub for all of these other streaming services, even though, like, it was a weird, like, okay, you can watch them on here, but you also need to be subscribed to the other thing to watch them on here. So, like, they tried to, like, do too much too fast, and now this feels like kind of a scramble to try and format themselves into something that, other streaming services are already doing more efficiently. Right. And the other thing, too, about this HBO deal is that the way it works is that you pay for Max, which is the regular subscription, and then you pay for the pay-per-view individually, but if you pay for the HBO subscription, you'll get a discount on the pay-per-view, which is currently selling at $50 every month if you were to use Bleacher, for example, right? Right. It's well, and, them. and the thing is, is that's kind of narrow casting your pay per view buy revenue as well, because you have to imagine that then on that basis, HBO Max is going to take a cut out of this. But I would also wager that part of the reason they structured the deal like this is that they realized that they're going to have to figure out a way to make some money into this in spite of Tony's booking. Right. And everything that goes with the pay per view buys, most of it will be going to HBO. Now, you can still get AEW on a regular pay per view, kind of like how. People can still buy WWE pay-per-views 
on cable TV or whatever. But the detail that's kind of been lost in this is that AEW, with all this stuff happening, they... So with the pay-per-views going away from Bleacher Report, they have to go on some normal cable services or other stuff like that, right? right. This models exactly like the way the UFC does their pay-per-views. Which so, is not necessarily a bad thing, but I don't know if AEW is ever going to get the publicity to make that kind of business model worthwhile. But here's the here's the issue, Sean. The UFC pay-per-view model is at least 15 years old. Or at least 10 years since they've been on ESPN+. Plus, Because they've been doing the streaming stuff for a while. So HBO Max and AEW are way late in the game to do this type of stuff. Yeah. And AEW does not have the cachet that the UFC and WWE have. Yeah. Well, and and their Warner Discovery is really, really hoping that AEW can get its shit together because they're seeing... WWE sell out stadium after stadium after stadium after stadium after stadium. Did you guys did you guys see the ratings for the fifth year anniversary of Dynamite? Yeah, it was six hundred eighty thousand. Yep. Wait, how much? Six hundred and eighty thousand. Oh, so six eight zero 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 zero. Yeah, that sounds about right considering what they basically stagnated on ever since they showed that punk footage and ran off about a hundred thousand people on average mm-hmm. and, that's and, about what they get and this this was the show where they sh- hot shotted the ricochet will osprey match which ended in a disc well actually it ended in a double pin draw and the crowd hated that so they restarted the match just to have kanosuke Takeshka come out and cause a disqualification so you gave away the entire reason why Ricochet came to this company in the first place to w- to wrestle they, Will they, Ospreay, just to do a DQ finish. No, no. The thing is that they punched their audience in the dick twice. Exactly. This was a CIW punch to the dick to, to send a fans. message. They wanted no, to no, send no, a no, message. No, 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 don't group my don't, don't group my shit in with AEW. <laughs> right there. Listen, as, as a company that has outdrawn TNA, I will not take <laughs> Jimmy Cornelius made a vented. A single match video. Anyway. Um, other details about this Warner Brothers stuff that needs to be brought up. Nothing for Ring of Honor. That's That silence is our thoughts on that uh, and on yeah, Ring I of mean, Honor as a whole. NXT is a developmental is worth a TV deal. Is Ring of Honor? No. There you go. Does anyone outside of the three of us even know that Ring of Honor is still a thing? Well, here's the thing. The very, very few, maybe 50 to 100,000 people that know AEW also know about Ring of Honor and care to watch it. Well, and it also doesn't help that Tony Khan's booking matches that were Ring of Honor matches 15 years ago and expecting everybody to be caught up and excited about it when that's just not the case. This company has always had the problem of starting everything smack dab in the middle, and if you were not following from 1992, you have no damn idea what the hell's going on, and they don't care to explain it to you. Yeah, I, I like my... I like my... Re- I like my wrestling with a decent amount of homework, but not the amount of homework where it's like I'm studying for like my final exam at the end of this quarter semester of my college. And again, it's the issue with AEW that they're also continuing to double and sometimes triple down on these trends. Supposedly, they have trademarked AEW Shockwave with the hope of getting a third TV show but on something with cable like Fox no. because they're hoping to take that spot away from WWE that went away from Fox. Well, but that's what, but that's the dumbest logic. If the biggest company in the world just got booted from Fox, why would they take the sloppy seconds? Well, it's not that they got booted. It's that WWE chose to leave Fox. So they're trying to see if Fox will be like, hey, we still want to be in the wrestling business. But the thing is, like, my thing is Fox really put a lot of restraints on WWE. Like, God forbid any fan in, like, the 10th row put put up a middle finger, the entire screen goes black during SmackDown. 
AEW does all kinds of stupid, crazy shit all the time. I imagine like half the show is going to be black screen mute, black screen mute. If Shockwave is on Fox, it's going to be a disaster from the production yeah, side. Moxley on that show. Yeah, <laughs> imagine Moxley being on a Fox show and it not just being thirty minutes of black screen. The whole show would be blacked out, and we wouldn't have to see his balding, idiotic face. And this is coming from a bald guy. And I'm offended at his bald guy. Like, honestly... Yeah, then... but here's the thing, is that your baldness is classy. His baldness looks like a 60-year-old man who's trying to get one last ride by taking Viagra pills and shoving down the nearest whore he can find. He looks like if Benjamin Button had cancer. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. Yeah, now, li now, now listen... That? There, there are other details about this particular show that are just really big bullshit. In all honesty, we're not going to learn all the details right now. That's why, I like, this is going to be a continuing story. But here's my thing at the end of the day when it comes to this with Warner Brothers, okay? They lost the National Basketball Association, which you could argue right now is the second biggest sports league in the entirety of the United States of America. And they replaced it with All Elite Wrestling. L-O-L. Well, if, if, I'm going to have to disagree with you there just on the phrasing of it, because it's not that they lost the NBA. They gave away the WNBA and the NBA. They gave away both, one of which actually draws most of the time, if your name's not Caitlin Clark. But the fact is that Warner Discovery has made a laundry list of questionable decisions since this merger. And I don't know the direction that the overall company is headed in, let alone AEW, but AEW is going to eat comfortably. And the good thing is, is whatever deficit that AEW would incur because now Warner Discovery and HBO Max are getting a, a bigger chunk of the pie by necessity so they can make some money back on spending so much, that doesn't bother... AEW or Tony Khan, because Tony Khan can make the drop of a hat chain, you know, it means that money means nothing to Tony. You know, it's a drop in the bucket for him. So it's really a win win for all of the people, you know, if we want to go to Jerry, all geriatrics wrestling, you know, Chris Jericho is going to be working there 25 years after he's dead. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we're going to hear from the learning gravestone. Chris <laughs> Ghost of gimmicks past, Chris Jericho. Alongside the inner ghouling. Chris Jericho's so fat that it took him five years to die. Like that's the like uh, he's he's so large that it took a long time for all of his organs to fully shut shut down and stop working. See, we joke about that with Chris Jericho, but that's actually what's happening to Marty Janetti. And <laughs> Sorry, Marty. I don't mean to kick you when you're down. <laughs> yes, you do. Yes, you do. <laughs> no, I don't. No, I don't. That's mean. That's mean. I have no animosity. Yeah, but who's accused like... us of being nice people, okay? Well, listen, I have no animosity with Marty Janetti. You could say that I have no bad blood. That's right. Bad blood 2024. Let's get to the meat and cheese of the matter. The cult of meat with extra cheese, as a matter of fact, because we have a big show to talk about, and references to other podcasters aside, what did y'all think about this show overall, Josh again? I thought that this was, uh, for the most part, a very, very good show, despite some um, instances of me having a severe uh, difference of opinion on some Match placement and booking decisions, uh, which we will get to at, throughout our review. But overall, uh, I thought this was a very good show. Well, I'm going to go second because Skylar said something the other day in the chat to us, so I want him to go last. So I'm going to go second here and pretty much agree with what you said, Josh, again. I mean, it's I'm less... I've softened my stance on the match positioning of this show not because of who's responsible and why, but more so that you don't really have much of a choice 
to book this the way that you position it when you only have five matches on your B shows. And yeah. this was one of those instances where we tossed around where do you place these things. And really, it's a tough thing to do when you have so few matches on these shows. Where this show could have stood to have one more thrown in there somewhere just for balance sake. Yeah. As but, much as much as I love the five match uh, format for these shows, it does get kind of cramped and leads to these situations where there's little to no wiggle room whatsoever. Yeah, to work, you know, sadly, best case scenario here, even without what happened in the post-match of the main event, just for the main event significance alone, you almost have no choice but to put the Hell in a Cell match first. And that's that's the difficulty here. Because I really think it's, it's worthy of being a show, a match that closed a show. Mm -hmm. But if you're going to do it this way with the card that you've built, I guess this is what you have to do. But at the end of the day... Every one of these matches had something in it that I either laughed at or enjoyed. And so for that reason, I really don't have any really major problems with the show. But the guy to my right might. Mr. Skyler. Well, the thing is that I I said that this was one of the worst shows in the Triple H era of pay-per-views. Which, by the way, goes back to SummerSlam 2022. Let's establish the timeline okay yes yeah that that was i think you universally is what we would accept as triple h's beginning right except for that weird in-between period where vince McMahon came back but anyways beside the point uh this is right down there with the extreme rules 2022 pay-per-view and that was the second pay-per-view so they really didn't have much wiggle room there because they were still trying to find themselves and figure it out but I don't blame Triple H for it. I blame a certain Mr. Dwayne for sticking his Johnson. But again, we'll talk about it when we talk about it. There were other structural issues with this show that, to me, made it very weak compared to the previous pay-per-views. I don't hate this show, but I hate certain decisions that were made in the service of other people getting to do certain things. Well, I am fascinated to get into this with the two of you gentlemen as this is going to be a very interesting and, and I, I sent a photo to Josh again and I don't know if I sent it to you Skyler but in my notes the first thing I wrote was hell in uh and I had to cross it off and write bad blood 2024 because out of force of habit I, I because there's a hell in a cell in October I immediately was like oh this is hell in a cell the pay-per-view and I was like wait no that's not right and I'm glad that it's not right. It's nice to have Bad Blood back, and it's also nice to have the acknowledgement that this was the 27-year-to-the-day anniversary of the Hell in a Cell, which I think added to the significance of this opening match we're about to talk about. Agreed. It is the blow-off, the final match between CM Punk and Drew McIntyre. And as... Rough as it is that it went first, I gotta tell you, gentlemen, this is definitely in the nominating room for match of the year in my book. Agreed. This, this is not my match of the year, but it is absolutely up there, and this it's is up there. up there also as far as like top Hell in a Cell matches of all time. This was fantastic. <laughs> I mean, was this not the capper to the undisputed feud of the year? Uh, agree. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Without like, a doubt. And, and it like nothing's to going to, nothing is going to touch this particular feud. Basically, since Survivor Series of last year to now, my God, they told a well-made story. Even though it wasn't intended to happen, but it just kind of did. But in all honesty, it made it even better. This is one that, those are the best kinds of stories. It's one hell of a pivot. Yeah, it, it really was, and I think that now the best part of that is, even though Seth Rollins is doing this thing with Bronson Reed, we still have all of that to go into between Punk and, and Seth, and you know, there's so many places for Punk to go from here, and same with Drew. I mean, mm -hmm. it's it's fascinating. This feud has made both of them must watch wrestlers and not even just that 
But the mm-hmm. layers that this has added on to Drew, because, like, Evers, honestly, they, what they've been doing with Drew since mm-hmm. WrestleMania from 2020 when he won mm-hmm. the belt in front of nobody. Everything mm-hmm. that, that has happened to Drew since then, mm-hmm. like him getting screwed in uh, the first Clash mm-hmm. of the Castle, and all the way mm-hmm. up to now, and where he's just become this bitter, mm-hmm. angry, like scorned, forlorn psychopath. Mm-hmm. Drew McIntyre is one of the best things in WWE. Just everything about him. Without a doubt. And, and actually, this feud, as much as I've loved what Punk has brought to it, this feud was made by Drew McIntyre. Agreed, agreed. You know? And and that's something that I really appreciate. But let's, before we get on to that there, we, they show Killer Mike from, from Run the Jewels and Cole, and Michael Cole says that Killer Mike took his name from Cole. And I was like, bet, Cole. I bet that a, a long since 90s rapper was like, you know what? I see this weenie of a man on pro wrestling television. That's the man I'm going to name myself after. By the I, way, Corey and Cole were so unhinged on this evening. <laughs> they were all yeah. over the place. Yeah, but I do have to say, the amount of times Corey Graves brought up money and financial compensation, I liked that. Mm-hmm. We don't hear enough about that. Yeah, the we winners don't... were he mentioned once yes. on this night. We don't hear about the winner's purse enough. Because yeah. it, it incentivizes, hey, winning and losing is important. This was a very weird commentary because at points they sounded like marks. But <laughs> yes. not the way that Tony Schiavone or Excalibur sound. I don't know no. how to explain it. That's a good call, no. Skyler. Yeah, no, it's... uh. They're more like WWE marks as mm-hmm. opposed to marks. When we when we get to it, there was one word that Michael Cole used that made me. I I was watching and ha- slash listening to this while I was at work. We'll get to it, but I laughed so hard I had to pull my car over. There were a lot of moments that made me fall out of my chair laughing on this show. We'll get to those. <laughs> and but Punk comes out and I'm looking at him and I'm going, man, you know, it's been almost a calendar year. And it still feels surreal. Agreed. Seeing CM Punk come down a WWE ramp. It's, I mean, he's been hurt for most of it, so, you know, we haven't been able to get it. Yeah. Much. yeah. Honestly. But, but at the same time, just the significance of it. Honestly, that injury, I think, benefited CM Punk because we didn't, like, get overexposed to him, even though I don't think that would have been a problem. But still, like, this made us want to see him more. Especially because we like, especially the way that Drew threw it in our faces about it, mm-hmm. you know, and and that was such a big part of the storytelling of this. And I was told that Abyss is the guy who produced this match. Well done. And boy, what a master class in Hell in a Cell was this. And you know, and there, there was, I will have to say, there was a lot of Mick Foleyisms through Abyss that we got in this matchup. <laughs> Yeah, that, that were, but I loved you know they started to use the cell at the very beginning just to reestablish that that's a malicious part of it, and you know I loved the idea that Punk beat the crowd to the table chant. Mm-hmm. I was like, good, don't make like I would love just preempt it, get them out and just leave them out, and that way they don't they can't chant that they want the tables because they've already gotten it, and. Then they get into this with the with the toolbox, and the second that I see the toolbox, I'm like, oh no, wrestlers and tools is a bad combination. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and uh, the worst part is that it was in the shoot way too. Yes. Well, in this case, they kept it simple. It was just unadjustable wrenches, so there wasn't a whole lot of mechanics involved. You just had to swing shit at people. There were so some animals the though. There were some animals. That's right. Well, the two locks in the cage. Uh, There's. Go watch Super Jam Session version 2, but back to the match. That's right. Well, and then, but the creativity of the spots in this, mm-hmm. the fact that the table gets pulled out and the first thing Drew does is yank the table legs off of it. I'm like, well, I haven't seen that. Uh, yeah, and then CM Punk tried to stab him in the face with part the part that was like sticking out. And I was like, oh my God. Yeah. And like they Even zoomed in, they drew into the table legs upside down. Yeah, you know, with the table being face up, knowing that they can't really stack it or break it. Yeah, that was really clever. 
And when he picked Drew up, you could see like the like the the, the indentation on Drew's back from that, and it was like, oh. Yeah. And then later on, when they, they later on when they zoomed in on Drew's face when they were outside the ring, you could see like not not like big cuts, but there were like tiny little cuts and like bruises on us uh, uh, Drew McIntyre's head from like. Oh man, I just I just got the greatest tag team idea ever. Oh no. Because there's another man who's only cuts and bruises. Uh, the former tag team champion with Drew McIntyre, believe it or not. That's right. From 2010. That's right. Amazing. Anyway, <laughs> it's uh, at this stage. Well, though that might be a feud we can look forward to in the near future if we get a you know draft in 2025. Anyway, I'd be down with that. I'd be down for that as well. Uh, but the, just the way, the, the intensity that these two threw at each other. But it was so well paced. It didn't feel like they were just walking from spot to spot. Everything registered. Mm -hmm. Everything was personal. They let things digest. Mm -hmm. And the fans in Atlanta were rabid. And the selling this in this match. match was immaculate, which helped. Although... Anything to contribute, Sky? Before Sky I mean, can, you guys are you guys are taking all the words out of my mouth. Just keep going. Well, here's another one that I'm gonna take directly from your from your uh, throat and your like yeah that entire cavity from whence oxygen and food go in and come out. I don't know where this bit went, but there was a part. Speaking of the crowd, where Point out the crapper. There was a part where the crowd started chanting "Fix the screen." Because apparently one of the screens in the building turned off, and they couldn't see what was going on, and I and I'm just like, not during this match. The other matches on the show fine, but not WWE. I don't know what the deal is, but it is like the past, like like this something similar happened at WrestleMania where like the lights shone down during the AJ Styles LA Night match and blinded some fans, and they missed most of the match. It is 2024. How are we still having these kinds of production snafus? Thankfully, this one only lasted for like 30 seconds. But still, I was like, oh, come on. How are we still having these technical issues? Lee Fitting. I'm, I'm talking to you right now. Ch oh. Change your name to Lee Fixing. <laughs> well, he did fix it, so... Yeah, but... He did fix it. Yeah. Because the date didn't last very long, and it didn't overtake the rest of the matchup. I was very worried that it would. But... Drew, Drew does this big lawn dart to Punk, and the second that he does, I'm like, guaranteed he's getting juiced. Oh yeah, and the way, yeah, honestly, the funny. the camera, the camera shot for that, and the way Punk bounced off the cell, that was that's one of the most brutal cell bumps we've seen in a while. Yeah, this for the first Hell in a Cell match that Lee Fitting has shot, this was spectacularly captured. Mm -hmm. The whole way through, I thought. And, dude, when they turned the camera back to... And the fact that they, like, they didn't have the camera on CM Punk for several seconds and were just focusing on Drew, you knew that Punk was getting some color. And when they turned the camera back, dude, the reaction of the crowd. They were like, yes. do you remember the, the, the Hell in a Cell match between Cody and Seth when Cody took his jacket off and the crowd went, oh... Yeah, like we all did. Yeah. It wasn't quite to that extreme, but it was a similar reaction like, oh. Oh. We're getting yeah. blood. Oh. <laughs> you know, I've noticed that WWE has been using blood a lot more, and it's always CM Punk and Cody Rhodes. Well, they are two of the bigger stars. Well, they're very discretionary as to who gets to use it and when. Mm -hmm. And that's the way it should be. You know, make it matter. Not you know, not every match on every show ever. Yeah, and not just because one person feels like doing it in every match he's in. Mm -hmm. And you know, but we get the you know the the steel stairs to the dome, and you know, one of the best shots, the best visuals in this entire match was the wrench in the punk's gnarled face. Oh yeah, that was nasty. Like that, what a hell of a visual that was mm. between between those two. And I like how the WWE uh, YouTube sh uh, channel posted it because they they did like a highlights part of it, and they said graphic, but they showed it. Yes. They didn't black and white it. They showed it. 
I I hated like for years whenever something remotely dangerous or uh, viewer discretion advised, they would either black and white the screen or God forbid anyone got hit in the head, they would like freeze frame for like a split second and then show the immediate aftermath. And it's like, yep. did my video just buffer or or are we just watching a, a pussified version of wrestling? How much of that do you think is because of their operating partner, UFC, being so used to the blood and the violence? Whatever it is, good. Stomping their stance. Yeah. Which helps, because I think Vince was a little too tiptoey with the shareholders for a long time trying to be the Walt Disney of wrestling. That they don't necessarily have to be anymore, mm -hmm. which, which helps. But they're still being discretionary, which is also valuable. You know, and that's that's really what we're, and this is what I said and when this started getting going with the with the chair legs and whatnot, I said this is what Edge versus Rollins desperately tried to be. Yeah. Because, but is that know, Seth Rollins' fault? Because my god, they had the other Cody Rhodes and Seth Rollins had the other great Hell in a Cell match in the last three or four years. Yeah, I mean, but, you know, you, I would, yeah, I would get lipstick in my Valentino bag every podcast. And that's what happened there. I think it's not Seth Rollins' fault or Edge's fault, really. It's just that, can you imagine what that matchup could have been if both guys were able to get some color? Because the match itself between Edge and Rollins was good, but there was no opportunity for that. And also, so speaking really of color. How there's only so, even though like Seth and Cody was like the exception because mostly because of the injury Cody had, it was so hard to take the cell seriously when it was Candyland. Yes, thank God. Thank God that is dead. But now, hang on, hang on, hang on. There is a moment that happens in this match that the second I saw it, I'm like, okay. God damn it, why did you guys do this? Is it the double wrench handle that was countered into an exploder, which was very cool? No. Drew McIntyre is getting another table after he's basically being a punk, right? Mm -hmm. From underneath the ring. Did you guys catch the fact that there was a TV screen underneath the ring showing the match as it was happening? Mm-hmm, I saw that. Yeah. Okay. The fuck? That's that. That's an oopsie. That's definitely an oopsie. But that's something that they've had pretty consistently. I'm pretty sure there's a ring crew guy that just lives down there. Yeah, this wouldn't be the first time we've seen like a camera or like a screen underneath the ring. So that honestly didn't even bother me. I was like, oh, there's another screen. Did, did, did Hornswoggle leave the pay-per-view on while he was underneath the ring? <laughs> yeah, how else is the Little People's Court going to watch the show? <laughs> Racist. Yeah. Well, wouldn't that be sizest? No, they're a you different species. <laughs> they're a different species, a different race. Like the the shortness is part of the race. Whatever well, you say. Anyway. But like, then then we get this spot, and this but where Drew goes to grab Punk, and Punk has got the toolbox, and wham! Dude, the noise it made was great. And then they did the same thing where they focused on CM Punk for several seconds, and they were like, oh, we're getting double juice. And then yeah, they well, cut back to Drew. Thing. Holy the shit. That I heard that thud. I said, oh, that's hard way. Yeah. And sure enough, you see the squirt from Drew's head. And I'm like, oh, that was, that was Roman Reigns at WrestleMania 34 kind of busted open. Yeah, or... Randy Orton and Brock Lesnar at SummerSlam. And you don't know what caused it? He, Punk accidentally hit Drew with one of the latches on that tool case. Oh, I was going to say the handle. Yeah, that'll yeah. do it. That'll do it. Yeah. That was nasty. And, but, it, I mean, well, it saved Drew a step. <laughs> yeah, it did. By the way, did you see the, the tiny mistake that CM Punk made with the toolbox next? 
he gets to the top rope and intending to do like an axe hammer with the toolbox and then he falls down and he's like motherfucker no he, he no he it. dropped it he dropped it and he was like well <laughs> i guess i'll just get in the ring and just hit him with it and <laughs> no, then no, he no. tried to you could see the, CM Punk as he drops the tool case look down and say motherfucker then he gets to grab it and hit him <laughs> well i mean i you know what i attribute it to they're hurt they're bloody they're tired they're fighting it's a struggle improvise improvise <laughs> And again, Corey Graves with the great commentary. We're officially on the Muda scale. Yeah. As uh, yeah, he was throwing in some amazing references all throughout. Yeah. I mean, this is like stuff that like the great Muda, the Sheik, the Iron Sheik, um, Dusty Rhodes sometimes. Like this is like reminding of those bloody battles. Yeah. Oh, they were they were they were getting into it, and I loved. Just a part of this where CM Punk barely gets the bulldog off of the high knee, but it's fine because it's exhaustion. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and little things from Punk, like where he hits the GTS and Drew rolls out, but Punk tries to frantically grab the leg to keep him from leaving the ring. Mm -hmm. Yep. You know, little things that help the storytelling so much. looks like Braveheart with all the blood dripping off of his face. It's like it's, and, and at this point, I'm like, this match slaps. Yep. The 16 staples that went into Drew McIntyre's head were not wasted. No, they were not. No. no. I, I do not envy that man. Uh, no. I've had I've had four staples before, and that was that that was not fun. 16, I can only imagine. Yeah, and I love the, you know. What did you two think about the sharpshooter? Debate this real quick while I disappear and reappear. Uh, well, while the um, uh, the magical and mythical uh, Sean Houdini uh, does his magic trick, I honestly love that CM Punk kind of fell when he was trying to set it up because, again, even though it was technically a botch, you could easily just explain it away with the dude has been bleeding for like 15 minutes and is physically exhausted. And Joshua? Yeah. They did a sharpshooter while Goldberg was in appearance. Good. That that's amazing. Yes. I didn't even think about that. But that's they, they did a sharpshooter while Bill Goldberg was in the building. Just amazing. <laughs> yeah. And it was a I loved the way it looked like a struggle. Mm -hmm. Like you could almost afford it. But, you know, speaking of, can we take a quick side tangent here? Because I saw something the other day that fascinated me. I think I know why Brent Sharpshooter looks better than everybody else's. Not just because he's better at it, but because he locks the legs from the left instead of the right. Mm -hmm. So when you see guys lift, pick up the leg, they usually cross the right leg over the right, you know, the left leg of the guy and then cross the legs on the right hand side so they've kind of got it tied and their legs are wrapped around their right arm. Mm -hmm. Brett would use the up, he would flip the right leg over that left leg, but then he would flip the legs over and actually hold them on the left hand side so he had a more a, a centered force of gravity over the entire body so when he turned over on his left side he actually got a better vantage point for the grip and then was able to sit down on it so it actually looked tighter and more efficient mm -hmm. now it's random but i noticed that yeah but in any case i love that punk did it. yeah and, I, and right I, and after I, after the sharpshooter they do exchange of punches punch for punch chops and then they go through the table with the superplex spot that scared the hell out of me because, like, yeah, they're professionals and they were careful about it, but the way the table broke, especially under one of CM Punk's legs, my brain immediately yeah. went, "Oh God, don't don't tear any like muscles or joints in your leg with the table." That that scared me. I love how they tried to tell the guys off and the fans booed the towel, so they went to a wide shot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So they're like, no, you're not going to get to see us clean up our, our professional wrestlers. And I love how even Drew McIntyre was like, get the fuck away from me. I'm busy. I'm working. But then, then we get the reference to Tommy Rich and Buzz Sawyer. But to your point, uh, Josh, again, when, he, when Punk's knee landed on that shrapnel, I'm like, 
God, thank God he was wearing knee pads. Yeah. Because that could have sliced him up bad. Yeah, that that that's that made me very. I was like, okay, all right, he's walking. Well, he's selling, but he 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 doesn't look like his legs bother him. Oh, so we're in the clear. Yeah. Well, then we get a second DTS with a great false finish. Mm -hmm. And we get the white noise on the steps. Oh God, that was brutal. Yeah, and it, it was all brutal. And it was just getting like you could feel the exhaustion developing further and further and further until finally we get the the pray to me moment mm -hmm. where he says pray to me and, and instead Drew McIntyre gives him the message sender. <laughs> yeah. This company we can favorably compare to CIW. Yes. That I will be fine with. But after Drew does it, his head opens right back up, and it looks even cooler. Well, the reason why is because CM Punk had been bashing him in the head with the the with the wrench. No, oh, it's just this match was so good. The visuals of this mm -hmm. were, but then, then boys, I got scared. I got excited. I won't lie, because out comes a purple satchel. It was black. A dark purple satchel that may or may not have also been black. Over Jean, let's call it. <laughs> and out it comes and I'm like, oh no, come on. Don't do this. But it turned out to work because it was friendship beads. And the friendship beads, but of course it turned back on Drew McIntyre because the beads ended up getting... Oh no, before we get to that, then Drew McIntyre tries to do a claymore that scared the absolute teetotal shit out of me Dude, when he missed. I and landed back of the spine first Shawn Michaels casket style. I steel steps. I fucking screamed. That like that could end a career, yeah, honestly. That was disgusting. When he did that, that and he landed. Like every and the the crowd reaction, Michael Cole screaming on commentary. Oh my yeah, we god! All like, oh no! <laughs> oh paralysis! Thy name is Drew McIntyre. And the thing is that that took Drew out long enough for CM Punk to wrap a chain around his knee so he could load up his knee, and he grabs some of the bracelets that have the, some of the beads that have landed on the ground shoves them in the Drew McIntyre's face, does the GTS with the loaded knee in order to finish off Drew. Mazel tov. It was incredible. Hats off to both guys. And pray for Drew McIntyre's spine. By the way, do you want to know a fun story about the friendship bracelets? Sure. Yes. The original girl that gave Punk the friendship bracelet back in 2012 was in attendance, personally attending with Punk as a VIP. Ooh. And Punk gifted her a friendship bracelet afterwards. Well, that's cool. That's, that is pretty cool. So again, they went from trying to sell her friendship bracelet without her consent to be like, okay, just come to the show and please don't sue us. <laughs> we'll be nice. But you know what the best, the best part about this is? Punk comes back from all friends wrestling and says... I'm not here to make friends. I'm here to make money. And he spends the better part of a year feuding over a friendship bracelet. <laughs> Drawing buckets of money. What a gigantic fuck you to the young bucks and Tony Khan. There is no amount of them shooting themselves in the face. The way that AEW does, New Deal or not, that makes up for that kind of defiant. Go fuck yourself. And I am here for it. I am here for it. Me too. Me too. The other what? part is that the afters, the afters of this match with Punk not being able to get back to the backstage on his own and needing an oxygen tank and help. And Drew looking absolutely despondent. Yeah, I am really interested to know what happens next with Drew McIntyre. Because it's He's got to go. He's got to move on to something, but I don't know where he goes and how he handles it. Well, the first thing is that he needs time off to recover. Oh yeah. Well, the good thing about Hell in a Cell is that 
both guys can kind of take some time off television and wait until they're, you know, build up the return a little bit. Yeah, Drew can go see if his spine is still attached. Yeah, because it wasn't really looking good there. But, boy, what this, we said it at the beginning. This is one of my favorite Hell in a Cell matches ever. It's, it's top three to five, I would say, for my book. Yeah, it, it is definitely up there for me as well. That's a hard measure, and it tore my heart up when Cole was like, this is the 63rd or whatever it was, Hell in a Cell. I'm like, oh, my God. We padded those numbers so hard. Yeah. But, you know what? Remember the first... The, we, Remember the first Hell in a Cell pay-per-view where there were three Cell matches on one night? Oh. Absolutely awful. Yeah. But, we have to cool down. Because what a hot shot that was. Mm-hmm. And I'll tell you something. These two women wouldn't let us cool down. As slow as it was, they got us back into this. At least got, they got Atlanta back into this. Mm-hmm. But the only thing is that, and I'll get into this right now, the fact that the Hell in the Cell was first, nothing was going to top it. No. Yeah. No, and I do not whatsoever envy Bailey and Nia Jax for the gargantuan task that they were given following that. But they did a good job. Yeah. But you got to give those ladies credit. They delivered. I would say so as well. I, at least that's the way that I came out of it. I, they didn't have to have this kind of match that they did and tell the story that they did. And I think that they actually had the better women's match of the night. Yeah, I would agree with that as well. And, I mean, we'll talk about the other women's match, but yeah, I agree. Although, we get Jacqueline and Lillian Garcia and Booker T, and then they go to a skybox with all the oh, minority wrestlers. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, you get, don't forget, though, they, they made sure to use Booker T's entrance theme music. Scott didn't get that. Booker T got that. Yeah. And, you know, the goal of that guy asking about black wrestlers and opportunities in the press conference, when they literally had the minority room <laughs> on the show, I, I kind of skipped through those segments, to be honest with me you. Me too. I, me too. No, it's just funny that, like, here are all the black people. <laughs> they in a skybox party. <laughs> Because you can see that place to be. That's where I want to be. Because you can see, because you have Bianca, Jay Cargill, and Naomi partying in the front. You got Jay Uso and Apollo Cruz in the back. It's a good time. Everybody's getting lit. And and they get to watch Bailey, who I won't lie, I like Bailey a lot, but she's losing a little bit of her luster for me. Yeah. It's it's only because I don't really feel like she has a proper direction right now. And it's not that she's like a bad as a wrestler, quite the opposite. She made two consecutive matches with Nia Jax downright watchable. Yeah. Although it, it's I just... would almost give Nia Jax the underrated comeback female of the year because her matches have really not sucked at all this year. Agreed, which is a shock. I mean, she's going to be nominated for Women's Wrestler of the Year because she's been one of the best women's wrestlers for the entire year. It's going to be stiff competition, and she's going to lose to Rhea Ripley, but still. What universe are we living in where she's even in the conversation? This one. <laughs> that... Well, it's this, you know, it's this one because it's not necessarily... She's like a, a viscera who actually understands body language better. <laughs> Like, the level of injuries is about the same. And humps people less. And humps people less. <laughs> not none, but less. <laughs> <laughs> but in, in this case, Nia Jax has done a lot to understand the in-betweens of the moves that she does. That she didn't have before. And that has really played to her credit. And I also think that she's trying harder. Yeah. I would agree. She was before. Although I have to say, I feel like Nia's theme music is a little too cheerful for a menacing beast. Well, what do you want her to do? Go back to not like most girls? Well, that's what she was using. Like a, a, it was a, just a different cut of it, but it's still 
It's still too jubilant. I want her to... She needs to come out the 3-6 Mafia. Someone's gonna get their weave split. You know, that, that's uh, what Nine needs to be doing. But I, uh, also, can we just say the fact that Nia Jax is breaking out wrestling moves that I've never seen her break out before. Oh, we're gonna get to that. We're go we are definitely going to get to that momentarily. We're gonna get to that. <laughs> but well, first things first, like they do like the exchanges and like Nia Jax does her power stuff, whatever. And then she starts doing submissions. She does no. ankle locks. She she did she did the attempt, a fragilely sad attempt at a heel hook. And then <laughs> She went for a quarter of a Boston Crab. Not a half Boston Crab. A quarter of a Boston Crab. <laughs> that was as much as we got. But this is trying. And then she gets thrown to the outside. And Bailey goes to do that splash. And Naya caught her. Or just like stood there as Bailey flopped in front of her. But, you know, that was, that was something. And then, the spot of the night. Oh, no. Uh, okay. Sean, you just, Somebody. you describe, you describe, and I will give my, uh, severe reservations after I think that. Skyler is the best man to describe this, this interaction that happened next. From, from I don't know if I can describe it, though. <laughs> well, they, okay, I'll make an attempt at this. So... Bailey is going to go for that power bomb that she did when Nia was on the second ropes and Bailey was going to go underneath and, and power bomb her like she did at SummerSlam. Didn't quite go that way this time. As Bailey takes three steps and then Nia falls like a newly birthed baby hippo. And Bailey, not sure what to do because this was some weird, sad attempt at a hurricanrana. There's a split second of utter confusion of, do I sell that? Do I take a bump? What do I do? So she takes two small steps and kind of like tumbles forward. And then they get back into it. And everybody knew it was supposed to be a Rana. And when I say that I and my chair fell to the ground and I was laughing, for I had to stop the match. I stopped the show. And for five minutes, I could not get up off of the floor. That was the best Best botch in the history. That is the botch to end all botches. <laughs> Who gave them the okay for that? That was my question. Who on this this fucking planet was like, you know, Nia Jax, you should try a Hurricane Rana. Dude, who thought that was a good idea? Did, did, I are, don't know, but thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I agree. I agree with that sentiment. <laughs> I, I don't know why you tried it, but thank you for trying it. I don't, I don't know this what may, drugs this you were may taking. Be better than my hole. No, that oh. that far eclipsed my hole. Undisputedly, that was better than my hole. That, that was the greatest. I've ever seen Nia do. That was the dumbest idea for a spot I think I have ever seen in my entire yeah, life. Just, was, I watched it like five times. Just, she's not like most girls. Most girls on this roster can at least try a Hurricane Rana, or at least. But the funniest part was Bailey trying to figure out what the hell to do after after Nia fell down so awkwardly, like. I didn't even look close to her or Karana, but Bailey had to do something. <laughs> that it was so good. That mo so that good. slight moment of, uh... Because it's like, do I bump for this? Like, <laughs> what do I do that's not going to make us both look like idiots? And she came up with something. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that was hilarious. Whoever's idea that was. Sean, like, as much as, like, we are kind of a little, like, tired of Bailey, and, like, it would help if she went away because she's still the only horsewoman that's still wrestling right now. Oh, my God, like, you're right. At least in WWE. We're not talking about AEW. No, she's the only no, horsewoman no, that's still right. wrestling. You were right the first time. Right. 
like Bailey still like is performing. Like, no, you were you were correct. <laughs> <laughs> but, but WWE, like Bailey, is still upper tier, upper echelon women's wrestler at least in the ring. She's just not interesting to listen to talking. Yeah. 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 Ding dong, hello. <sighs> Yeah, I know. Right. Bailey, Bailey, in many ways, kind of feels like male, female Seth Rollins in that she needs to go away because of an injury or something. Well, well, she might. Because then the next spot is the sunset flip powerbomb that gets her squished. <laughs> Bailey needs to retire this spot. She, you know, listen, I didn't mind No, no, it. she needs to do the spot with anybody else besides No, Jack. like, she did the same spot with Naomi on SmackDown a couple weeks ago, and it looked even worse than this one. Like, she... And, you know, the sad thing is, this wasn't even the only one that looked like crap on the night. <laughs> we got one of those in the other match. No, I actually liked the one that Liv Morgan gave Rhea Ripley. Like, at least Rhea Ripley, like, was the only person that looked like... She took damage on the move, and it was up against the barricade. And I was like, I can't believe I'm saying that Liv Morgan did a move better than Bailey. But Bailey needs to retire this stupid sunset flip. I do think that was pretty funny though, because Nia hit it, and then you just see plop, and the entire crowd went, and, "Oh no!" <laughs> it was a good move, Bailey, but you may also now be dead. Yeah. And but then we get a Triple H stairs bump. Mm-hmm. Uh. Then we get the power bomb on the steps, and I did have to say, did we really need that spot after the Hell in a Cell match that we just saw? It's women, so it's different. Question mark. Yeah. It's the power bomb and not yeah. the white noise. Question mark. And yeah, I, I don't know, but anyway, so they get back into the ring, and then Bailey botches a Samoan drop. That was not on Nia. I went back and I tried watching it three times. I don't know what Bailey thought that spot was, but pop up Samoan drop was not what was in Bailey's head. Also, I think she was trying to go for a Rough Rider question mark. <laughs> there's, <laughs> there's, a, there's so many question mark in this one match. I love yeah. it. <laughs> it was, it was a little bit of a miscommunication, but then we wondered when it was gonna happen. Mm -hmm. Tonight was the night we got our first female ref bump. Well, before that, before that, I do want to give props because we're glossing over a spot that actually really woke up the crowd because the crowd was the crowd wasn't dead. They were just kind of yay for this match. Bailey doing a Samoan drop on Nia that was great. That did wake people up. That's a good point. That was impressive. Well, and and that that's really what got me. And to the credit of these women. This crowd could have just been gassed and stayed gassed, and they did not let the crowd sit on their hands. Mm -hmm. They built this up. Then the ref bump happens. Well, I just love the fact that, like, Nia and Bailey are fighting over Jessica Carr. <laughs> like, <Yeah. laughs> like, she's the step stool in the middle of the two of them. And Nia oh. falls down and breaks the step stool. Perfect spot. I think that for the first female ref, ref bump, it was the best spot to be in, and Jessica Carr was the perfect ref to do it with. And she sold her ass off. Mm -hmm. Jessica Carr, I was so impressed with her selling during that ref bump. It looked realistic, and it didn't look like she was just knocked the fuck out like they do, like Charles Robinson being out for five minutes at a time. Mm -hmm. That looked realistic. And I, I give her a lot of credit for that because there's a lot of pressure on her to be the first female ref to take a bump. Well, you know what the funny part is about Jessica Carr? She's ripped? Well, other than the fact that she's the first female referee in WWE, do you want to know who she was also refereeing with at the same time in 2017? These two? Aubrey Ed. I was just about to say... This the, Jessica Carr is what some people think Aubrey Edwards is. Well, you know what? The truth is, we all just have to evolve. And eventually, we just moved on from horses and went to cars. It's just the natural evolution of things. Jesus which Christ. Christ. That joke was brilliant. <laughs> that was such a good joke, Sean. Thank you. We did, we did evolve from horses to station wagons and now we have cars that break every time we try to drive them 
for when Naya gets in them. A, a, a Mercedes is a shitty car, I'm just saying. It breaks well, down a lot. Especially yeah, when you kick it in the spine. Uh, well, in any case... <laughs> We're throwing so much shade right now. It's tippy time. As she comes down, and I must admit... I don't love that they're relying on this to be the backbone of everything that Nia Jax does, but they're they're progressing this well, and they're making it unique and creative. Because that was a even, lot even though t- even though Tiffany Stratton fucked up the first briefcase shot. Yeah, she did, and almost tripped running to the ring. But she made up for it. Yes, she made up for it. It was so quick. It just everybody. Nobody faulted her when it happened. It just it just happened. And everybody moved on because the angle was still hot. I mean, let's not forget the in. let's not forget the last time we had an almost cash in. Well, the time before that, Damian Priest coming down to the ring at WrestleMania and hitting Drew in the head with the briefcase so hard that it went flying almost into the fifth row. It was like, wait, I need that to, to cash it in, bring it back. Yeah, but this was this was maybe the best part of storytelling, and I have to admit, Nia Nia pulled this off beautifully as Tess. <laughs> Tiffany Stratton with Jessica Carr and is about to cash it in. Nia Jax doing her best Kane impression. And she was dressed in red, too. And this looks at her like Frankenstein's monster, and it was the funniest thing. It was great. It was like, she she sat up like, the fuck you think you're doing? (laughs) Um, excuse me, ma'am. Yeah. But then that roll-up two count had the people. Yes, I thought that was it, too. Not gonna lie. You know, and, and almost in a spe- it just, it went so well. And then finally, you know, the distraction ended up being too much. Nia Jax finally got the advantage and hit the Annihilator. A, a less stiff Annihilator than some of the other ones we've seen. They're still scraping uh, Lyra Valkyria off of the mat in uh, Saudi Arabia as we speak. Yeah. But- Even though, again... Uh, they also screwed up the briefcase because Bailey didn't hit Tiffany in the head and she still took a bump for it. Yeah. But that was kind well, of out of camera frame, so we can just gloss right over that. Well, there was a lot of stuff on the night where there was some execution that just did not work. Yeah. Or it just didn't land, but the people hardly cared because they were just invested in it, which is kind of all you can ask for. You know, that's how you know that your your shit's over is if you can make mistakes like that and it doesn't really affect the overall flavor or quality of the match. It's like the whole it, idiots like us who go on a podcast and analyze every bit of it. It's like the whole HBK versus Undertaker thing at WrestleMania twenty five. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. That it, it it had some bumps, but I overall liked this match. Me too, me too. It it had its clunky moments. And not clunky as in, oh, it's a struggle. Clunky as in, whose oh, fucking idea was that? Yeah. But it and was the good. the best one of all time. Yes. The Let's have Nia Jax try a Hurricane Rana. Just, Jesus. Whoever needs, whoever whoever's idea with that, just, whatever he's smoking, <laughs> give me a hit of that. Ab- Abyss produced the Hell in a Cell. Joseph Park produced that. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, Joseph Park the uh, produced the one with Jessica Carr, who's better than Aubrey Ed. That's right. He needed to park his car. Oh God damn. Anyway, we are yeah. That's that's where we're at, folks. I hope you're having a good time with all the puns that we're throwing together. Yeah. But while I uh, while I change some tracks here. Haha! <laughs> you're changing tr- you're changing tracks. What like what kind of racetrack? That's well because the, you know WWE's doing a really good job of training their audience, mm-hmm. and uh, you know Skyler's gonna push me out of an airplane if I keep with all these transportation jokes. <laughs> <laughs> all right, now we're on to match three. Well, before we get to match three, Sean, I know you're not gonna care about this, but me and Skyler do. Damn it. The fact that this next match was sponsored by Dragon Ball Sparking Zero made my heart grow three sizes. I was excited about that. Although, again, I love that they're doing a story about Xavier Woods being the one guy who like has not won a singles championship. And he's the next show, he's in a promo segment 
showcasing the exact reason why he's never been a singles champion. Yeah. <laughs> Xavier, this is why. The Sparking Zero car was really cool looking, but this is why. You're a dork. <laughs> yeah, but he's got a YouTube channel to market that, so... Yeah, and the viewership goes up, up, and down, down. WWE in other ways than the world title. The fact that they let that dude run his own YouTube channel with every wrestler on it playing video games and make his own part of that revenue, he won. Yeah, I, I just wish that he was better at a lot of different things. Me too. Like wrestling, for example. Yeah. Anyway, they, they do more shots of, you know, legends inside the building. Which was nice to see as, as we get Scott and, and all those folks. And Freeze, I'm not get... going to lie. Some of these guys look really old, like X-Pac. Like, my oh, God. He's, he's, he's up there. But yeah, but it was nice to see Tully Blanchard and Arn Anderson together. Yeah, in a place that actually cares about them. Yeah. Yeah, I think Atlanta's still kind of WCW country. Well, well, of course, well, and definitely Jim Crockett country, if nothing else, you know, but, but definitely. But anyway, then we get to this matchup, which I was looking forward to. I won't lie to you, because I, I think that the way that they built it was, was kind of nice, and I knew what I was going to be in for when I listened to a Finn Balor matchup, so I was ready. Majin Yabu. Uh, Yes, Damian Priest versus Finn Balor. Your thoughts on this match, Skyler, as I quickly disappear and reappear. I think this match was fine, but after CM Punk and Drew, any sort of, like, animosity, quote, unquote, was not at the same level. And Joshua, I hate to say it, but this felt like a TV main event more to the pay-per-view match. You're not wrong. I, I enjoyed it, but it was also just kind of, The main thing I cared about in this match was Broly on one side of the ring and Ultra Instinct Goku on the other. That was the main thing I was paying attention to for this match. And whenever Damian Priest would punch the teetotal shit out of Finn Balor. Which was frequent. Yes. Damian Stryker is quickly becoming my favorite striker in WWE. Yes. Yeah, and well, because he's hitting a great part of his outfit when he does it. And, uh, also, real quick, they, they, they also speaking of what were you thinking, Finn, you are not Voldo. Like, this is the weirdest Soul Calibur cosplay. Whenever he comes to the ring, I don't understand this. I'm going to cover up my entire face except for, like, this one, like, this straight white line design on my weird mask. You're, I, I don't get it. I... It's, it's something. It's something that's not the demon, which was shredded shoelaces, so I'm, I'm, I'm good with that. Um, if you're going to be but, Voldo, you have to weirdly gyrate and walk on all fours backwards. We'll give it a little time. Give it a little time. I mean, the sling blade is like halfway there. Also, so, speaking of which, can I just say, I know you don't like the sling blade as a move. I like this one. But... I love the way Finn does it because the way Finn, like a lot of people, like they like Seths. He looks like he just spins around them and it, and like what what is happening? Finn actually looks like he's like trying to slam them down on the ground. Finn, as a counter to the charge, I thought was really good. Mm -hmm. You know, because that kind of matched momentum. Mm -hmm. With Seth, some of them look good, some of them don't. Yeah. And I've also felt the same with earlier Finn Balor, too. Kind of the same scenario. He's, he's sharpened that up a lot. Yeah. Same thing with his Eye of the Hurricane that he does. It looks like he is driving that elbow right into your damn chest. Mm -hmm. And, but, then we get some kicks as Finn Balor was hitting Damian Priest with the Ya Boots. And, the Balor goes to from the top and Damian hits a punch that knocks him straight down. And the commentary team losing their gourds on that was really nice. Yes. You know, it's kind of weird to me that, like, Finn Balor is not a very big person in WWE, but if he was in the AEW, he'd be really, really tall and, like, jacked. 
I would go so far as to say that Finn Balor would be maybe the guy you should frame that company around if he was in AEW. That's how good he is for the kind of show that Tony likes. He would be a guy that would be worthy of main eventing and would probably cut better promos than two-thirds of the people there at this stage. Think about the person who is saying that about Finn Balor right now. He'd also wrestle better matches than 99 one-hundredths of the entire company. Like, to be honest, like, Finn Balor kind of feels like where Will Ospreay would be if he was in WWE. Kind of. Kind of. I, I think there's there's some, there's a case to be made for that. But I, I, I've i really grown on Balor lately, not just because of the Yaboo thing, but I also just have really enjoyed his work more because I think he work, he's matured mm-hmm. in, his, in his work style. Having said that, he's never going to be in the main event level ever again. And Corey Graves acknowledged as much. Like, he straight up said, I don't think Finn has been the same guy since he was the Universal Champion for a day. Well, I would also counter with, I don't think he has to be. I think Finn has done enough now, especially as far as character development is concerned, where he's... He's made enough to where he doesn't necessarily need a title on him anymore. He's a utility to player. Make, to make something interesting. I think that this is a, a, the right scenario for him, actually, in this in this case. Mm-hmm. You know, although I will say, I do think that we're going to talk about the, the finish of this in a while. We're not, we're not there yet at all. But I personally think that Balor probably needed to win this. But I'm assuming that this feud isn't over either. So I'm not as worried about it. But in, in any case, um, I really loved the counter the tilt uh, that became a tilt to world Russian leg sweep. Mm-hmm. Uh, Damien did a, a push off of the ropes to a twisting clothesline, which was unique. Um, the fans were into this, but they weren't losing their gourds. Kind of to your point, Skyler, about the fact that like no and no grudge feud was going to out grudge Punk and Drew. Yeah. No matter how much you tried. No matter how much you tried. And they did try. And I think these two do have some chemistry together. Yeah. Also, can I just say, speaking of commentary, it made me so happy that Corey Graves acknowledged like their history in NXT and the fact that Finn Balor actually defeated Damian Priest for the U.S. title a couple years ago. Continuity is nice. Which I had forgotten about. Because that... United States title run from Damian Priest was a whole lot of ho-hum. But, Sean, he would get mad. Like, re- not just regular mad, but really, really, really mad, and then get disqualified a lot. Because of Rick Boogs. Yes. Don't we miss Rick Boogs? Rick, no. Rick Majin Yaboos? Yeah. I'm crossing the streams now. Well, apron up. Uh, then we get the gut wrench into the razor's edge which i thought was nice um i loved when balor raked the eyes because balor is increasing the amount of shortcuts he takes you know i'd like a little more cheating on his part but he's adding more into it without sacrificing his match quality and i also thought on this particular spot Corey graves was brilliant on commentary explaining like did you see how finn balor like used his body to block the referee's line of vision while he was scratching at the eyes it shows yep. like he's willing to take shortcuts, but he knows how to do it and get away with it because he's a veteran. Well, like, yep. th- this is the kind of commentary I like. A little oh, yeah. bit. This is exactly what you want out of out of a color commentator. Is, yeah. You know, analytical. You know, a little bit of analytics. You know, I love the balance that Corey Graves has found under the Triple H administration. Mm-hmm. He knows just the right amount of healing, so it's not over the top the way that Vince had him do it. Mm-hmm. But he also knows when to just analyze and create a point on that. But he also knows when to be a contrarian. Mm-hmm. And he also knows when to go, just be completely unhinged and try as hard as he can to make us laugh. But that was more in the, the, the following match. Yes. He figured that out, too. They both are unhinged at certain points, and it's great. But then then we get this interesting point where it looks like Damian Priest is going to throw Balor into the announce table but chooses a razor's edge onto the apron, which I also thought was really gnarly. Mm -hmm. Pops to Balor for even taking that spot. And then we get the shenanigans. Tell them about it, Sky. Again, like, 
how can you describe it other than the Judgment Day doing the bloodline and training stuff? And yeah, also, uh, J.D. Bless- McDonough wearing Joshua's favorite shirt ever. As soon as I saw the words treat, uh, street trash with the that font that looks like goo, I just started giggling. Although I'm sad that they never got a shot of the back with the world's angriest garbage can. That would have tickled me. Yeah. Well, sadly, we're going to have to get different photos of Dak Prescott another time. But in any case... Oh, God. <laughs> Sorry, Dallas. You're an easy target. Um, anyway... So, I just, I just, with me, it just feels like the Judgment Day doing more Judgment Day run and bullshit, which is not special or unique or interesting. Also, a, a wild Carlito appeared. Yeah, Carlito yeah. shows up so that JD McDonough can drag Drew, uh, uh, not Drew, Damian Priest off the ropes and then tries to distract again. It's just, there are some things where it just feels like, okay, why is this not a DQ? Well, I mean, they did distract the referee when they did it. And the, the I thought the coup de gras false finish was got a good pop, mm-hmm. uh, but then this really started to pick up. I actually really liked the finish on this one, mm-hmm. uh, because right after that, you know, with the with the chair shot that Priest counters to Balor, and then Priest tries to go for the south of heaven that's countered into a two count with a with a roll up that's the kind of flipped over the sunset flip. Then there's just the relentless coup de gras like onto the neck. But each one gets weaker and like and less stable, and he's like getting more reckless with each time he's doing it until finally he gets countered by the South of Heaven for the pinfall. Yeah, I like that as well. I, I also a really unique finish for what the story was they were trying to tell, even though to your point, Sky, about it not being interesting in the interference, part of it is that it doesn't work for the judgment day. It worked for the bloodline. But the judgment they never do it and it's successful. Yeah. And I think that's part of the reason why, as much as I liked this finish for what they were going for, and I know this feud isn't over, it would have been nice to see that interference pay off for once. And it just didn't. But that doesn't mean that I have a complaint about the finish of this match, because I thought it was really good for the participants involved. And just how desperate Finn was more and more as those coup de grace kept getting shakier and shakier and it finally ended up doing him in. I also really miss him doing that to the back of the head and the back and the neck. Like, I, I, I know that Sean is not super crazy about his coup de grace finish to the, to the front. But I always prefer when he... Because he used to do it to the back of the head back in NXT and he stopped doing it. I guess because it's way more dangerous, but... It always just looks way more devastating when he does it that way. So I, it, it made me happy to see him return to doing that. Totally. Totally. I, 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 I did not hate this finish. I just think that Balor probably would have benefited from this win more than Priest does. Because I think Priest is pretty darn over. But I'm not sure that Finn is as over as a heel as he could be if he had gotten a win here tonight. That and we kind of need this feud to kind of end so Damian Priest could do something else. Yeah. Well, maybe. I I don't know. I mean, it would it'd be nice because because if... there's nothing left now for Damian Priest to do with the Judgment Day except maybe get Dominic Mysterio on behalf of Rhea Ripley. The problem is that the Judgment Day feel completely useless because this was basically three on one and they couldn't beat them. Yeah. Well, that, yeah, that's what I mean. It's like the the bigger question is now, what do you do with the Judgment Day? They're the tag team champions, but like, what do they do? And it, it's like, I, it's just a tough position where I think if Balor won this and that healing was effective, you could keep this going without it feeling like you're really having to force it because you just don't have anything else for the participants involved. And, I, and, and my thing is, like, what does Damian Priest do now that he's won unless they just, they just continue this? Because the world title scene is occupied right now. I mean, Gunther's going to be wrestling Sami Zayn tonight because we're recording this on a Monday. And yep. he's busy at Crown Jewel, which is something I'm, I assume we'll get to in a second. Yep. So, and we don't know who Gunther's wrestling at Survivor Series, if he is even wrestling at Survivor Series, which I would assume he is. 
I doubt it's going to be a rematch with Damian Priest. I doubt it's going to be Priest, yeah. Like, and I don't think Damian Priest is going to go back to because he's like, he already wrestled Jey Uso this year for the for the World Heavyweight Title, so I don't I don't see him wrestling Jey for the Intercontinental Title. I just that might be what they do, but they'd have to turn him heel, and I doubt they're going to do. I don't know what they do with Damian Priest right now. Yeah, they're in a place where I, I think that they've they've got momentum with him that they recognize, mm-hmm. but I I don't I'm not quite positive of the direction. I'm afraid it gets wiety, to tell you the truth. But it's I I don't know. I I genuinely don't know, and I think that that's why I they have no choice but to keep this feud going. But if you were continuing this feud, it kind of feels like Peller needed to win here. You know, it's like but. In any case, I trust the process. We'll see what happens with these individuals. You know, I'm not I'm not giving up hope that they have no plan. But in all in all, a good match. A good match. A, not, not a ton to complain about. And then we move on to the other women's world title, the world heavyweight women's title. Hold on, was when did the whole Triple H thing? Oh yes, that's right. Then, then we got. I guess we got to go to this. Uh, then we get the "I stole my ideas from CIW and a Bizzle" part of the show. <laughs> As Triple H goes into the ring and says, "Hello, I'm Triple H, and I run this shit." And we and have the, the new highest gate record for one of our shows, which means thank you for paying an absurd amount of money to be here on this show. We're gonna thank keep, you for your money. Thank you for your money. We're going to keep raising the prices so we can keep breaking the records, and you're still going to cheer about it because humans are weird. Can we not be nihilistic about this stuff? No. You're right. We, we should be a lot more honest. It'd be like, thank you for your money. And speaking of people who give us money, the Saudis... <laughs> a lot of money my favorite part concept my favorite that well a quote unquote new concept but my favorite part is the second he mentioned Riyadh, the crowd booed yeah the crowd was like oh do, do, do this on raw yeah that, that was the vibe i got i literally the vibe i got from that room was do this on Raw. Don't put this shit here. <laughs> but remember, Raw's only two hours now, so they don't have Thank time. Thank God. Thank merciful That's God. That's only temporary, though. It's going to go back to three. And this SmackDown's also going to be three hours. Kid, SmackDown's I'm... going to three. I'm so excited. So, hope you like Kurt Angle, because there's going to be a lot of milk. And <laughs> But Triple H goes, okay, we're going to have Crown Jewel titles where the world heavyweight champion and the WWE champion of the men and the women face each other for this belt, but it's and no belts are going to be on the line because it's canon, but it's non canon. So, you know, he basically said without saying it, okay, it's Riyadh. It's like not really canon. So we're giving them their own thing here. That's, and which is this belt. Look at all these, <laughs> look at all these chickens on this belt. This, this is so close to being like, in all honesty, the Tony Khan books a show thing. Thanks, guys. As, you know, but it, it really was, as this thing gets unveiled, and it is a pretty belt. I won't lie to you. It's a pretty belt. I mean, belt. it's pretty gaudy. It's pretty yeah, big. It's pretty big. Very decadent. And, of course, a man who flourishes in decadence, Gunther comes out, and then the segment actually gets worth watching. I was about to say, Gunther comes out to save the segment. <laughs> yeah. And Gunther starts cutting a promo and he goes, ah, Bill Goldberg. And I like how he doesn't just call him Goldberg. It's Bill Goldberg. Well, that's the tribute to Bret Hart. Yes. And he goes, and yeah, I know I said a couple weeks ago with your friend Bret Hart that you were my favorite wrestler, but I lied, Bato. And I mean, how could I like a one trick pony? And then Gunther gets or and Gunther, and then Goldberg gets up and he he mentions Gage. Mm-hmm. You know, he's like, I hope he's a better, fa- I hope he's a better father than he is a wrestler. <laughs> so then Goldberg gets all like upset, and the you know the agents come out, and he hops the barricade, and the agents come out, and Gunther says a go- a line that is pure gold. He's like, Oh yeah, come on, don't think about. It. I got three minutes to spare. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I was dying. 
<laughs> you know, it's funny to me that AEW has to swear and gets no reaction, and Gunther can be as clean and PG as possible with his insults, and everybody boos him. That'd be a gigantic dick about it, and it's the best. I, Gunther is my favorite wrestler, and this kind of shit is why. And he's also gotten better. Like, his in-ring stuff was always great, but now he's comfortable talking on the microphone and cutting promos. He's so good as these just smarmy, egotistical, I'm better than everyone, why am I even here right now, heel. He's so good at it. It's so good. I, I also, just, you can see the smile from Triple H. He just could not stop smiling <laughs> in all place. <laughs> like, Triple H is kind of like, oh man, I kind of wish I would be able to wrestle Gunther because, god damn it. He's like, this dude's so goddamn good. Uh, and he works for me. But the fans, you know, and, and the crowd are uh, of agents are kind of surrounding Goldberg, who never gets into the ring because then Sami Zayn comes up and starts attacking Gunther, and that takes precedence, mm -hmm. is that. So Good Goldberg didn't have to get involved with this, but they continued the Sami Zayn thing, and that got a pop, and then they play Goldberg's music. Goldberg gets the chant in Atlanta because it's Goldberg. And, you know, hometown boy, you know, had his biggest moment in that arena. So it was it was big for him. And, and it's exactly how you throw Goldberg into this spot and use him in a way that's meaningful, that doesn't compromise your wrestlers. Now, hopefully he doesn't try to wrestle Gunther. And beat him with one jackhammer that doesn't even look that good. I actually think if, if Goldberg did it, it would be the exact opposite. I think I think Triple H would have Gunther squash him. I, I think it'd be the exact opposite. But I will have to say this. You got to give credit to Triple H, the master diplomat, to get both, to get the feud of Bret Hart and Bill Goldberg usable for his wrestler he's trying to get over. Literally just, he's like, hey, use this feud to just take the piss out of both of them. And, and the fact that both went for it. Yep. That both went, it goes to show just how much respect Gunther has universally from the wrestling community that both Bret Hart and Goldberg were, were willing to say yes to do a segment like this to help him grow. And even The Undertaker on his podcast, he was talking like, he was talking like a Mark when he talked to Gunther. Mark went up to him and said, man... You and I could have drawn a shitload of money, man. <laughs> <laughs> that is the ultimate compliment. You know, it's like, that's that's the effect that Gunther has had. Even people who don't watch, even old wrestlers who don't watch modern WWE know Gunther. Mm -hmm. And that's a, the testament to that man's dedication. And I'm, I'm glad it, we got the does same it, on the Does way. it not say something when guys like Kurt Angle, The Undertaker, and Steve Austin wish they could have had a match with Gunther. That's how you yeah. know. That's the ultimate sign of respect. Yeah. And I'm sure and they're the not thing, alone in that. Do we call Gunther the modern-day Bret Hart? In a way. I think, I think it's hard to say that, only because I think Gunther is so much his own man. Yeah. There hasn't really you know? been anybody like Gunther. Yeah. Yeah. Because he's like an amalgamation of some of the... Like one of the old, like the oldest school wrestlers, but he's got technical prowess that those old guys didn't really have. But he's got mic skills that a lot of those guys did. Like he's the perfect storm of of what a modern modern wrestler is. I he's he's just he's so unique. I think people are going to look to be the next Gunther twenty years from now. Mm -hmm. You know that's which is real nice and then, uh. And maybe one of those people will be Dominic Mysterio. Because Before we get into this match, Michael Cole... Like, Alright, so the, the, the attempted Rana by Naya was Sean's belly laugh of the night. My oh, there's another coming. My belly laugh that nearly caused me to run into a tree while I was driving. Michael Cole, like, the, the graphic for Rhea Ripley and Liv Morgan came onto the screen, and Michael Cole was like, The amount of backstabbery! In this feud right here. <laughs> yeah, I remember him saying I, that. I damn near lost control of my car. I was laughing. 
And then Skyler made it even better. It was like, is, is, is Cole trying to, like, sound like us? That does, I mean, uh, would that not be what he, uh, we've said, maybe Michael Cole is the mole. Maybe he's the one who's watching our show. Tell us, Cole, well, Cole on the net, on a, at Survivor Series, blink three times at the beginning of the show if you're listening to us. Yeah, Michael Mole. See, oh, there you go. There you go. Coincidence? I think not. By the way, hello, Trish. Not Trish. Uh, hello, Mickey James. And I don't know why I just said Trish. Hello, Mickey James and Scott Steiner. God damn it. It was great to see them, albeit random, but great to see them. And then they go back to the uh, the press box, and smelly Chelsea Green is a gimmick now. Yeah, I got a, I, 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 uh, uh. They were like, you're too white for this party, leave. Yep. Also, well, bang, Diamond Dallas Page. Thank you. But Piper, but Piper gets to stay. Because she's fat. Hey, yeah, people like the right... Hey, hey, people like to ride thick white bitches. Yeah, yeah. Especially I'm, I'm black rappers. And seeing how I am one. <laughs> you are not a black rapper. <laughs> rapper, that is. <laughs> I mean, are you a wigger? <laughs> Next match! Next yeah, well, match! Go ahead and move on to that. Liv Morgan uh, so and... Something, 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 white nuts and a bizzle. Um, I really, I really like miss Sam my wig. But it bounded. <laughs> but this just Sam went Ellis so far off the rails. Rhea Ripley versus Liv Morgan for the, for the for Women's World Heavyweight Championship. As I'm maintaining my composure as best as I can, as I think Josh again may have just died. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, what what did y'all think about this match? I'm gonna go disappear for a second and then come back. God, why why are you doing a magic show mid podcast? Like prioritize. I think, I think it's just called. <laughs> you know what? You know, what? You know dying laughing. You know what? You're right. You you, you take 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 five, Sean, and and like just think about Nia Jax trying to do a Hurricane Rana. Uh, I mean, speaking of cringe, this match. Uh, this was the worst thing on the show. By far. And not only was it just the worst thing, but it's just... I, I don't even necessarily know who to blame for this. Actually, okay, yeah. I know who to blame for this. I just feel like, boy, this match had so much potential and it just didn't work. I didn't hate it. I didn't think it was bad. It was just, eh. It's just Liv there. Morgan and Rhea Ripley have had better stuff. They had a way better match at SummerSlam. Yeah, and I, again, I made the joke that like Rhea Ripley has spent a lot of her career beating up Liv Morgan. Yeah. So there are so much different things here. I just I don't know. Also, this thing with Dominic Mysterio and Liv Morgan doing the low rider bit. Oi. I didn't mind Kill it. Kill me. On honestly, Kill me. I'm disappointed that, like, at some point, at some point, they have to have Rhea Ripley in some way destroy Dom's lowrider. Why haven't they done that yet? Because every time, every time they zoom in on it with a camera backstage, I'm like, are they foreshadowing Liv, uh, Rhea Ripley destroying this thing? Well, no, they, they, they just wheeled it back. It. They just wheeled it back. Yeah, it's coming. I'm guessing it's coming. It's just they don't want to. They don't want to blow that wad yet. I personally well, hold on, hold on, hold on. Speaking of blowing wads, though, dear God, Rhea Ripley, um, <clears throat> uh, uh, put it back in your pants, uh, Skyler. She's a wonderful lady. <laughs> You're implying that I have pants on to begin with. <laughs> put it back under your folds, then. You're you're implying that I have folds to put stuff under. Well, hey, I'm pretty sure that Rhea Ripley has a tall, muscular, maybe Australian guy that she maybe hangs out Australian, with. Maybe Australian, yes. 
That yeah. I, don't know. It, I think I, I think I need to borrow that Dominic Mysterio toilet paper. Well, I mean, it's it, one might say that it's her pal and or her buddy. Well, I'm not your buddy guy, but I will say this: this match was not the worst. The shark cage stipulation is still stupid, and I yeah. have yet to see one of these matches that has turned out not shitty. This had potential, and I don't think Raquel itself was the catalyst for this not being that great. But they did have some moments, mm-hmm. you know. I, th- but including one of the st- another incredible spot that made me laugh like hell <laughs> when Rhea Ripley's on the outside. And she's shaking off her knee. And Liv rolls from behind and goes to do a chop block at the exact moment that Rhea lifts her leg. So Rhea completely whips and just slides underneath Rhea's leg. Oh, I saw and that too. Then has to jump back up like Scrappy Doo and tackle the leg and try to, try to jump on it. She but, missed the chop block and it was like, improvise, single leg takedown. It was, it was just like, there's not... That was just such an accident. That's nobody's fault, right? <laughs> just the timing of that whiff was just the one in a million. Honestly, she would yeah. Do that at the exact moment that Rhea would lift her leg to sell it. It was just so good. That was pretty funny. It was oh, that made me laugh. I'm like, oh, that's not even her fault. But then we get up, and then Liv does a leg attack, take a drink or a scoop of ice cream, <laughs> which you don't really see many of anymore. So we give her credit for that. And a scoop of ice cream. And I do have to say, <laughs> then Rhea did a Northern Lights bridging pin and Liv's facial expressions made it look like she just came. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Go back and look at it, folks. You know what? Actually, editor, I'm going to send you a screenshot of that exact face. Blow it up. That's, I want that to be front and center for like, Half a second. Uh, An awkward amount of time, absolutely. Zooming in on Liv Morgan's face as a puddle is forming underneath her during this Northern Light suplex. That's right. Now... The Northern Light suplex affected the southern regions. Yes, right. Okay, okay, okay. Thank you. If only Damien Priest here because then he'd take her south of heaven. (laughs) (laughs) And then Skylar must be Finn Balor because he wants to yaboo that joke. (laughs) Okay. All right. So, but can I spit in the face of this joke because it's not cool? No, he was in. The, he was in the previous match. He was in the previous match. That's right. Well, at least we didn't question why Carlito was there this time. So that's something. Well, I mean, um, Do- Dominic at one point did spit at Rhea Ripley. So close. That's close. That's close enough. But I will say this about Liv Morgan because we. We've been rather critical about her wrestling ability. Was that a fair statement? A tad. A little bit here and there. This scrappier Liv Morgan that does a lot more just frantic kicks and punches and uses the the ring to attack the leg and use the ring post, I like this Liv Morgan better than her trying to go toe-to-toe with Becky Lynch or Rhea Rip or uh, Ronda Rousey and look like she's going hold for hold. This at least makes more sense for her. Yeah. Also, I, I, we might not be at that point in the match yet, but there was a point where she tried to go for Oblivion and Rhea like front flipped out of it and still sold the leg because Rhea is great at everything she does. Then Leah, Liv Morgan does what should be her finishing move, this absolutely insane looking crucifix driver. Liv. The best what one she called done. the home wrecker. <laughs> yes, perfect. Yeah, uh, it's oh, amazing. The second they started presenting Liv Morgan as a slut, she immediately like fits in wrestling now. Yeah. Oh, hold on, hold on. Can we talk about that sunset flip powerbomb that Liv Morgan did to Rhea Ripley and the back of her head hitting the post? Yeah, yeah. Like, <laughs> that happened, and I was like, that was better than Bailey's. Infinitely, I, in my and opinion, then, it looked way better. And then this like. N- code breaker from the top rope that got a little like that was bad that that one wasn't good the code breaker looked good until like 
Rhea's face missed Liv's knees, and she did the code breaker with her feet. Yeah, that code breaker looked good until Liv jumped off the top rope. That's and then, then they were like, "Let's show a slow mo replay of it." And they're like, "No, no, how, let's not do that. Let's not I do that." Not. <laughs> I'd rather not. But I will say another creative thing that Liv is doing too. Rhea Ripley goes to throw Liv into the ring, and she slides all the way around and hits Rhea with a kick on the other side of the head. Thought that was unique. Mm -hmm. You know, I haven't seen her do that. She may do that frequently, but that was the first time I saw it look like anything. And then we get one of the weirdest forms of extirbation that we've gotten. Yeah. And I'll tell you why it's weird. Because I actually liked it here for why they did it. And it's a shame that it was bastardized for 17 years prior to this because it could have gotten some legi legitimately good heat. My only but problem with Liv Morgan doing the Three Amigos is it looks fucking ridiculous. I well, yeah. do not buy... It looks ridiculous because she shouldn't be doing it to uh, Rhea Ripley. Yeah, because Rhea Ripley getting suplexed by Liv Morgan... Yeah, no. Uh-uh, no. Yeah, I, right, I, I and then... That. Yeah. And then Dominic opens the cage because he's a thief, and he's a whatever, I don't know what you want to call it. Criminal. <laughs> and Cole he's says, a criminal. did you learn that in prison? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He picked the lock, did you learn that in prison? I also oh. love how Cole was like, he's now officially been behind these bars longer than he was in the clink. Cole, we, I wish, I wish that we didn't have 20 years of Weedy Shire so we could have appreciated you more before these past year and a half. Imagine how much we've missed out on with Vince McMahon in this man's ear. How much more we would have regarded him, how much more of a closer comparison we'd say to a GOAT status we'd give him. As opposed to what JR has been to his career. Yeah. We were yeah. robbed. Well, JR, no, we, we were not robbed. JR willingly gave it up. No, we were robbed of good Michael Cole. Oh, we were robbed of good Michael Cole. Yes. Agreed. Agreed. And then JR okay. decided to just remove himself from the equation. But here's my question What was the point of opening the door for Dominic? It's not like he can go down there. Well, he's claustrophobic. Oh. He wanted to be not closed in anymore, and he was trying to figure out some way to help, kind of. Well, he should have been trying to. I think he was trying to figure out a way down, but I don't know if it really. Uh... Yeah, I don't. This is the problem with shark cages: is they really have to stretch to find justification to do the angles that they do. I I'm just glad that he uh, did not slather himself in baby oil this time to get out of the cage. Yeah, that's, that's better. That's definitely better. Um, Rita did a yeet, and I went, ew. Um, and then the ref with the slowest count on the face of the earth as Rhea went to give Liv the riptide in front of the cage. Yeah. And I, it, it was a slow count because I thought the ref stopped counting, but then I turned around and he's like, six. And then a long time passed. Seven. Oh, he's still counting. Just every every count is at least ten seconds. I loved when Rhea got back in the ring after Dominic fell and was like stuck, hanging upside down. I loved that we saw the ref cam for the little mini conversation between Rhea and the referee. And then Corey Graves just starts going off on this referee. I was laughing my ass off. Well, that's Danny Angler or Rudy Charles. Yes, and and the thing is, I, at first I didn't like the fact that Rudy Charles was like, "You deserve that." When Rhea's like, "I'm gonna beat up on this scrappy dude for a bit," but then I thought about it. And I'm like, "Well, Danny Angles has seen a lot, and you know he's an he's an honorable man, and as an impartial you know referee, you know it doesn't really have to do anything with the confines of the match." So he has the opinion to do that, I suppose. And Dom is such a from counting, and you know, and Dom is such a despised heel. Like even referees like, don't like him. 
at first I thought he shouldn't have had that opinion, but also at the same point, like Jr. was very much like that too, where he would lean more baby face, but you know, he would understand some nuances there. Yeah. You know, and that's, I, I thought it was fine it, it, when they did this. And then, and then, and, and then we have the finish and the return yeah. of the, the biggest pop of the biggest pop return of the night, I would say. Yeah, why don't you bring, I'm going to say like my two cents here, and then I'm going to basically just let you guys talk this out. That because of okay. the history between Rhea and Raquel, which there is a little of, and definitely the history between Raquel and Liv, I'm fine with this to extend this, and maybe Rhea can do Raquel some good as far as teaching her some shit. So. Well, okay, Here, here's what happens, okay? Dominic tries to leave the shark cage, but he's also chained to it by his foot, and he ends up falling down because he's chained and he gets over-anxious. He is now hanging upside down like an idiot, and Rhea Ripley's like, you know what, I'm going to take my time with this. Gets a kendo stick and starts beating him up with the kendo stick. And Danny Angles is watching this from the ring, and at some point, he's like, okay, I think he's had enough. Let me get Rhea Ripley back into the ring. As he's walking over to Rhea Ripley, out comes Raquel Rodriguez. And what I actually thought was going to happen was that Raquel was going to run Rhea Ripley into Danny Angles and then take uh, Rhea and throw her back into the ring and beat her up so that way, uh, you know, she she would get beat up and then put Liv Morgan over. And then Danny Angles calls it, right? That is not what happened. Correct. No, Raquel came out a little too early for the spot and then ran into Danny Angles but didn't knock him out. And Danny was kind of like, okay, I can't do the spot we were going to do. So he walked back to the ring to look at Liv Morgan while Raquel is getting Rhea Ripley's prone body and throws it back into the ring. And there's this really awkward moment where Danny Angles and Raquel Rodriguez walk past each other without trying to look at each other. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like strangers on the subway. <laughs> like you and a homeless drug addict on the subway station walking past each other like... Mm. And then the bell was rung, but not by Danny Angles, but by somebody backstage because... Well, this is clearly a disqualification. Yeah. Raquel does her finisher. The Rhea Ripley puts her on the ground, puts Liv Morgan on top of her, and Michael Cole says, well, this is more symbolic than anything else considering it's a disqualification. It didn't ruin the finish that they were going to go for anyways, but I'm not going to lie. This was the worst executed finish I have seen in a long time. Yeah. Have you forgotten money in the bank already, Sky? But that was like, that was a mistake that was made by Damian Priest, who forgot to kick out. This was, yeah, that a... was pretty glaring, though. At least this looked somewhat confusing, but still somewhat made sense. It didn't put the referee in an inescapable position of looking like a dunce bucket. But it almost did. It it almost did. It almost but, did. And God bless Danny Angles. He, he, he passed by, he by looking. He was looking up at the trees, look, trying to find the hawk that just took the squirrel that he was feeding peanuts to. It was. God bless Danny. He tried as hard as he could to not see Raquel. My he favorite part was the definitely. look on his face. He put his hand on his hip, and you could see him talking in his earpiece like, What are we going to do? <laughs> Uh, I, I, to the credit of WWE, under previous administration, that match would have still ended with a referee three count. Mm -hmm. At least they said, all right, we'll do the DQ, and it's still, I mean, it, it, close enough, I guess. Let's just, fuck it. Let's just roll with it. it will, it'll be fine. It's still what we were after, and you know what? It's still an acceptable DQ, I suppose, so... Yeah, and also you know. it saves Rhea Ripley from getting pinned by Liv Morgan again. Yeah, I actually kind of think this worked in their favor more than it didn't. Yeah. Because I really did not want to see Rhea's shoulders hit the mat for a three count to Liv. But, again. It, 
but the problem is the way it was done was really bad given the fact that like oh this was not supposed to happen and that awkward 30 seconds of like i'm not trying to look at this person this person doesn't yeah, exist I, well uh, yeah i mean a botch is a botch it was and hysterical they, they could what they could. not gonna lie it was pretty hysterical but i just i felt bad almost <laughs> it was like I didn't think that the match was terrible up to that point, but that definitely did not make us leave with the warm and fuzzies, yeah. as they say. But I'm still willing to see this through, because I think the direction they're heading is fine. Because mm -hmm. Rhea needs to do something other than fighting Liv Morgan for a bit. Mm -hmm. So having her fight Raquel and maybe getting Raquel to actually be halfway decent would be nice. A little far fetched, but it would be nice. It would be nice. But wouldn't it be nice if we were all Samoan? I know, right? But unfortunately, we can't. That one white dude, though, with the big shiny belt. I know. He's, uh. Well, you mean black dude. Maybe. So the main event was. Maybe we use the word that you used earlier, Skylar may or may not have bleeped out depending on which version of this you're listening to yeah yeah I, the tap we're totally keeping it in i i mi yeah, i really right. miss my wigga well yeah that's right oh. See, that's acceptable oh. that way was acceptable <gasps> the way you said it skylar <laughs> naughty naughty kool-aid it's wait i have to say it with the a not the er that's right yeah the hard r is here don't we might need to pull the trigger on the keyboard elves if you keep that up it's no, there's no hard R's. It's Omen Ains and Cody Odes versus Jacob Fetu and Solo Sokoa. Jesus Christ. For the, uh, for the Roman is coming back and there's a main event after this main event and an eyebrow to be raised. Yes. So let's have a match before all that, I guess. Yes. Also, you two got very mad at me when I had the temerity to say I don't like marching bands. Well, here's the thing. I was in marching bands. My dad was in marching bands, and he led marching bands, so that was a big part of my musical life. So in that case, suck a bag of dicks. But as I said to you in the chat, I will meet you halfway and say that marching bands and wrestling don't really work. Especially when you're in Atlanta and you use the University of Arkansas Pine Bluff for whatever reason... As your marching band. Did this not... How many universities are in Atlanta? Did this not sound horrible to anyone else? It, it's not that it was horrible. It's that there's no way to balance the sounds. The brass is always blaringly loud. It's always going right into the cameras. And it's always just dominates it. And a lot of the times, they're playing it so hard that it's a very, very abrasive sound to the ears it's just it's what it is and it's a lot of these bombastic marching bands it works for a football field not in an arena and that's it's just not the right venue for it and it's it's yeah it just it didn't work for me and the, I, but the worst part though was when they started playing it at the same time cody's actual music was playing and it was just a cacophony of noise also, again, there were some production issues on this show. They did the wrestling has more than one royal Twice. family. Awkward pause, and the crowd was like, uh, where's the music? Uh, wrestling has more than one. <laughs> the only thing they would have made that better is if they had a recording of Cody going, Ahem. wrestling has more than one royal family. <laughs> Trot of the camera running all the way to Cody with his ear. <laughs> yeah. I said yeah, wrestling. <laughs> that was that was funny. Yeah. And then Roman comes out with the, the fucking choir from WrestleMania 40, and it sounds infinitely better than Cody's entrance. Yeah. Well, and here's the thing. You wanna know how long the entrances took? Yes. 12 minutes. I hear you guys were in need of some milk. 
Well, this is the entire milk truck. Can I say? <laughs> can I just say another thing that I just loved about just the entrances of this match? They could not have made it any more blatant as far as who was going to win this match. Cody Rhodes comes out with an entire marching band, and they get they play his entrance entrance twice. And then Roman Reigns comes out with a choir, and it's orchestral, and it's beautiful, and they take their time. Solo and Jacob came out with their music. You know, it's funny you say that, because I, halfway through Roman's, they shot the Solo's Tekoa, and I swear the look that he had was, come on, I don't get all that fancy-ass shit. <laughs> I swear to God, it was like, man, I deserve fucking pyro. Like, what the hell is it? Like, I swear, it like it bothered him that he did not have the pomp and circumstance of these two monstrous megastars but that also added to the story of the match i thought i yeah and it, but just initially the clash between let's just do our entrance and pomp and circumstance was just hilarious well well i mean because... the pomp and circumstances for the two biggest stars in the industry right now as everybody throws the one up to the sky to acknowledge the original tribal chief yeah and you know it, just to put something in perspective with the music, Sola Sokoa is taking it all, but Roman Reigns and Cody Rhodes have it all. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of where we're at with that. But I will say this, uh, the way that this match was constructed, I, I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it, but it was long. Indeed it was. Roman Reigns, long. what do you expect? I know, but it wasn't even Roman Reigns that was doing it so long. He wasn't the long part of this. He was in there actually a, sh a very short amount of time. No, but I will say about Solo, he's really impressing me how much more comfortable he's getting with each passing match. Mm -hmm. OTC my ass, slap. <laughs> <laughs> that made me laugh too. That was like, I'm like, here we go. Just this the way he said, about. OTC my ass. OTC my ass. Bam. It was just, oh, it's great. I so badly wanted him to be choking Roman in the ropes and go, this is my company now, you bitch. That would have been he, magic. He kind of got to that later on, but it's a, but he really is improving with the smack talk, and he's really getting more comfortable in that side of what he needs to do. And mm -hmm. I think that that is really helping him differentiate himself from Jacob Fatu, which I think this match did a good job of making sure those two entities looked and felt different. Mm -hmm. And I love that Jacob Fatu is so much of a wild man that he can just walk into the ring and pace around with the legal man and nobody does anything about it. <laughs> yeah, and the ref's like, all right. He's just, he's just so unhinged. He went in there. He literally paced around like Bane and Pink Guy with <laughs> Cody Rhodes. It was it, it was wild. It was, it, it, but, it, but it worked for the distraction. And then we got the most intriguing chance of the night. As Solo gets chanted at, you can't wrestle. And when that happened, boys, I must admit, I said, this man is, this man's going to be world champion. The biggest mark of being able to tell that you're going to be a world champion is being told you can't wrestle by a bunch of WWE marks. Also, the fact that we, every time he comes out, we get loud fuck you Solo chants. He, he's he's got... He's over as a heel. Yeah, he's got some of the best heat outside of Dominic Mysterio right now in the company. Mm -hmm. And But then you see Jacob Fatu do his shit. Jacob is so fucking good. Skyler, why does yeah. the WWE copy you so frequently? Uh, because greatness can't be unhindered. Well, gender, we know we're going to talk about gender another time, but this is uh, this is Samoans, not Indians. But that, but I will say, they tag in to Jacob Fatu after the hip attack from Solo, tags in Jacob Fatu, and the velocity he ran into Roman Reigns' head with. Yeah. On this hip attack made me jump. <laughs> Dude's fucking crazy.
It's it is insane. And then here comes comeback number one. And it just goes, it's another one of those things that I just I, I hate about modern tag team wrestling that both baby faces need a comeback. Sean, they gotta get their shit in. I know. I it's it's a modern tag team thing that that's you know long equals good both guys and in this case because you have the world's champion and the former world's champion this is one of the few matches where i get it mm -hmm. now here's something i will bring up i'm glad that solo and jacob fatu are kind of differentiating themselves in terms of what they do they're not exactly the same wrestler which is good because there was a concern that Jacob was going to outshine Solo yeah. because of how much better he is. Yeah, and this is a good way to show that that's not really the case. Yeah, they, they do, they, they're do. they similar-ish, but they do different stuff. I mean, the thing is that the bloodline is, they're all Samoans, and they all do the Samoan drop, and I'll do the Samoan this and the Samoan that and the Samoan this and the Samoan that. It's because it's what they've got. It's, it's yeah. theirs. It's theirs to use, so it's like, yeah, you know. Also, Jacob Fatu is the only person that should be allowed to do a pop-up Samoan drop, just saying. Yeah, that, I mean, Jacob Fatu reminds me more of Umaga than any other person related to Umaga. Yeah. Because everything That's the thing. Solo had shades of Umaga, but Jacob Fatu is Umaga. Shades of, Jacob... Solo has the body type of Umaga, where... Jacob Fatu has the intensity of Umaga. And the skill and it's set. Like all of his shit just hits like that much harder. And it's just it's so good. And but here's the question. Uh, is Jacob Fatu better than Umaga? Too early to tell. I was about to say the same thing. Give it time. And I also think that in large part, we didn't get to see Umaga in his real prime. Because mm -hmm. that was taken away from us before we really were able to get a chance to see it. Mm -hmm. I think we were just about to see some really big things happen with Umaga if they had stuck, stayed the course with him. Um, it's it's just a shame that he passed away before we were able to get the chance. But that being said, Jacob Fatu has just as much opportunity to surpass and in the same way that we just define Gunther as being his own man. I think Jacob Fatu has very much that same potential. And it's one of those things where, like, we were wondering, come on, this dude has to be called up by WWE at some point, even though he won't because of all of his st issues with, like, you know, legal stuff. Yep. And now that they have him, like, they, they have a lot of Samoan wrestlers. Obviously, Roman Reigns is the best one because he's Roman Reigns, right? Yep. I think you make a case for Jacob Fatu being the number two guy, and it's not even close. Yeah, yeah, I don't, I don't think you can either yeet or no yeet that decision. Um, we'll get, we'll get to no yeet in a second. Yes, we will. But this, you know, this really got in. They did that. The we get the we want Roman chance as we get into the second half of this. You know, the second wave of heat where they start focusing on the ha Cody's hand a little bit more, you know, Fatu biting Cody's hand. Then they do the double hip attack combination where they do the iris whip into the hip attack from one into the hip attack from the other, which was really cool, you know, and, and a neat set. And then, you know, I'm glossing over a lot of this because folks, there's a lot of milk in between these spots. I'm kind of hitting the high points here. Yeah. And then Jacob Fatu goes for a swan ton and, Cody gets the knees up, and they. the thing I noticed about this is they did the tag, the hot tag, in the right order. Solo gets the tag for the heel. Then Cody gets it for Roman so that the heel's already charging as Roman gets in and he's able to feed him. Mm -hmm. And it was perfect. And the pop for Roman Reigns to come in and do the babyface shit that we used to boo to death. The irony here i just it's it's amazing to me look at this baby face roman and look at 2018 baby face roman night and day it's it's almost two different people yeah Listen basically here. basically and the other thing too is that like it's not necessarily that roman reigns is the baby face okay he's not 
pandering to the crowd. He's not going believe in me or whatever. It's Roman Reigns have... being awesome and people wanting to cheer it. He's being a, a badass that you believe can beat the shit out of somebody. Yeah, and, and you also believe in his motives and that, you know, and we're seeing that he has, and, and as this post-match angle will prove, that he also has the capacity to still do the right thing when it comes to it. Mm -hmm. And that's, you know, we're going to get to that in just a second. Because then the first Uwa Spears caught by Fatu, and then we get the double super kick and the BME, I mean the moonsault that Jacob Fatu does. And the Samoan splash. Then we get our <coughs> PLE mandated barricade and announce table spots. But this storytelling with Cody and Jacob Fatu was spot on brilliant. I agree. I, the fact that, like, we, I was like, uh, yay, another barricade spot. That Jacob immediately no soul. He just no sold it and was like, I'm not just going to no sell it. That pissed me off. That did hurt a little bit, but I'm just mad that I missed. And he just starts going ballistic, throwing chairs everywhere. And, yeah. then, and then Cody slams his face on the chair. And he's like, stay down! And then he gives him the crossroads on the floor. And and Corey Graves is like, the craziest son of a bitch is still getting up. And, and then Cody's like, what do I have to do? Yeah, but, without, without actually saying it. And then just super kicks him until he won't get off the table. And then... Uh, this is the point where I'm like, oh no, Cody, Cody, don't, I'm afraid for your knees, Cody. Thankfully, Cody did the splash to the table without breaking anything other than the table. Yeah, well, it also helped that he stood on, like, the pillar and not the top rope, so uh, he had a little bit more room. And I love how he gave Roman Reigns a little goodbye salute. <laughs> it was like... Yeah, um, me and, me and Jacob are gonna be done after I do this, so, uh... That was that was my favorite part. Yeah. Because that was the best piece of storytelling in the whole match. Mm -hmm. Because it was Cody kind of thanking Roman for making that for Roman truly having Cody's back throughout that match. And he said, I'm going to take out this menace who is the biggest threat. I need you to take care of business and I know you will. Mm -hmm. So it, it was just, it was perfect for the whole tense moment between Cody and Roman that they built up to that when it came down to nut cutting time, as they say, the respect was there enough to where Cody, the world champion, left it for Roman Reigns to finish. Mm -hmm. Which almost that didn't happen point. because here comes Tama Tonga and Tama Loa. The Tongans. And everyone said, oh, God. But then... <laughs> yeah. Dude, I'm not gonna lie, SmackDown made... I had another belly laugh on SmackDown because Tama Tonga during the ladder match on SmackDown did a helo onto a ladder onto whoever. Turns to the crowd and, like, at least that entire section of the crowd, along with him, go, yeah, 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 <laughs> And the entire crowd doing that. I had... Sean, you had to pause the show from laughing. I also had to pause the show because I was just... I was that both sounds like something that would make me laugh. I died when the crowd did that. But yeah, also... The of destiny. Dude, this... The way they shot this next part. A billion out of ten stars. Because Solo hits Roman with the spear. Roman kicks out for a decent near fall. And Solo's threatening to hit the Samoan spike, but just over his, sh over his shoulder, under his arm, you already know the Tongans are there. But just barely out of camera view, all of a sudden you're like, wait, there's this third guy there. Who's this third guy? And then slowly Solo's like, wait, who's this third guy there? And then the Tongans are like, oh my god, there's a third guy there. And then when everyone's like, oh, who's that? He starts throwing super kicks. Then he takes off his mask and his bandana... Can you can we I cannot believe how big of a pop that Jimmy Uso got for this. That might be the biggest pop Jimmy is ever going to get. Just the way they built up to that and they the way they filmed it was and the way that Cole sold it before we saw anything. Yeah, was just cinematic perfection. And well, you say the biggest pop Jimmy's going to get, but when him and Jay Uso hug, well, 
We'll see. Yeah, but they've done that a couple of times already. Yeah. And then... I mean, I'm not saying you're wrong, Sky. It will get a thunderous pop, but that's also a reuniting of a team. I think a solo, a, a singles individual pop for just Jimmy Uso, that might be one of the biggest ones he's get. And that was great. The yeah. house blew. Yeah. And then and then that distracted solo, Roman Reigns spears him for the one, two, three. And I also love that, that they got a nice pop for when uh, Jimmy and Roman embraced, like showcasing like the, the history between those two over the past several years. Yeah, That was a nice and moment. Fact, and this is going to get glossed over just because of, you know, Jimmy's return. But Solo was cutting a hell of a promo on Roman Reigns as that, all that was going on. Mm-hmm. Where he's like, I was supposed to be next in line. You never wanted to give it to me. You took it from me. You stole from me. You son of a... Like, he's cutting a hell of a promo for Solo as all of that is developing in the background. It was just... It was great. And it was a good callback to that one because there was uh, one or two promos several years ago where Roman was like, Solo is going to be the next tribal chief. Yeah. And Solo was referencing that and it was great. Yeah, and th- that was that was really good. And, and I thought the finish was good. The second the ooh-ah that we got was so loud. Mm-hmm. That was insane. It was, to, but it was, it was a, it was a good match. Mm-hmm. It was just long. And milky. Very well, long. I mean, speaking of long and speaking of milky, let's get to this afters. So they're celebrating and like Roman gives Cody the I'm coming for you next although we did a good job and we make a good team so thumbs up you know <laughs> yep just, wait 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 I gotta stop you just because we've had the podcast we've had it started out with Booker T then Skyler threw a hard R word into the equation and then you Jessica just said we coming for you <laughs> <laughs> Steve Ray and Hulk Hogan eat your hearts out. Where is Hogan? Where is that man? Where is Terry? Go ahead, John. So, so after he said, "We coming for you next," but we still, we we're, we're, we appreciate what you just did. Uh, they leave, and the Timu Bloodline is pissed that they lost, so they they jump Cody from behind. I loved this interaction because Jimmy's like, "We gotta go help him," and Roman was like, "That's a one time only thing. That's a one time only thing." And Jimmy's like, you. I mean, it's up to you. It's your call. And without saying a word, Roman just looks at him, looks l- looks at to Cody, and is concerned, and just quickly pats Jimmy on the shoulder. And then they charge to the ring and clear the ring. I love that. And, and the pop that that got. Yep. The, everything story wise, every story beat that they did got a pop. Yeah. Right. And then the bloodline have been taken care of. Roman has the title. Doesn't want to give it to Cody, but gives it to Cody. And then... And you can see the respect there. And then the hand of Brian Gewertz. <laughs> Do you smell what Brian Gewertz is stroking? Uh, An iPhone to record what's next. Well, he was only using one hand for that iPhone. I don't want to know what his other hand was doing. Yeah, but it was pretty. That hand was pretty sturdy. If he was doing the other thing, there'd be a lot of more shaky to that. Video. Well, I mean, as much as he does it, he's probably got it down to an art form at this point. So he's maybe, he's maybe. Pro- he's very talk used about to it. Brian Gowertz's masturbation. We don't want to talk about Brian Go- Brian Gowertz going all Brian Skullwertz. Yeah, right into the Rock's eyebrow. <laughs> Rock's crusty, frosty eyebrow. The pop Rock's- that this got was also thunderous. Yeah, it's, you know, say what you want about the ego and and the scams and the shit that he does and how he has to have a camera crew literally everywhere he goes to the point where there was a hand sticking out of the Tron with that camera. And say what you want, he's still the fucking rock. The, fu- the funniest part was the second you two pointed it out and I saw it, the camera panned to try to get that out of camera shot so fast. Yeah. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> they were like, damn it, Brian. Brian, calm down. Yeah. You can get your 35th autograph today, later. Calm down. And while I, I must say, I do love The Rock's final boss cut of his theme music. Mm-hmm. It, it's in the same way that you like the really symphonic Roman Reigns one. I really like 
the final boss cut mm -hmm. of the Rock's theme music. It totally fits the dickery. Mm -hmm. And I also, I really loved that he held up the one, two, three, and then the throat slash. Because he could be meaning a number, th a number of things. It could be a reference to when he said, I, hey, Cody, I pinned you at WrestleMania. And before he delivered the, el the people's elbow to pin Cody, he did a throat slash. But that could also have been intended for Roman Reigns and Jimmy Uso. It could have also been uh, for Solo Sokoa, because Solo, as the new leader of the bloodline, has been losing a lot. You don't know exactly what Rock was intending that little message for, but you knew it was for someone. It leaves you with some entry. And, and the thing is with this, it's like, even if The Rock didn't come back, with it being Roman Reigns' first match since WrestleMania and the world champion in it, it's a real hard case to not have this match go on last regardless. Yeah, I, I, honestly, I've softened my stance considering what they did, even if The Rock didn't come back, where I was like, yeah, it is a tough, I imagine it would be a tough call between those two. Call. And it's like, a tough call. you win either way and you lose either way. So I have since softened my stance as well on that. But the fact that The Rock stole a main event from CM Punk... Hey, the, Does the irony not feel right there? The, the more things change, the more things stay the fuck the same. Well, here's the and thing again, about that. I wouldn't be surprised if in a year and a half's time-ish, we're going to see that develop. I think there is, there is a lot of distance that can be made with Punk and The Rock right now. But Punk's got other people to deal with first. Mm -hmm. Before he's there, I think. Mm -hmm. like he's right, and The Rock is busy because he still has matches with Cody and Roman Reigns to do. But again, having said all this stuff, the fact that Dwayne has to insert himself into stuff is so egomaniacally bullshit and changing the pay-per-view so that he can get the biggest pop. And again, all the shit that's happened outside the ring with The Rock and the bullshit he's done with the military and stealing the money from them and the movie production companies and stealing it from them. Uh, <laughs> we said that Logan Paul was the most believable carny-ass heel in wrestling, and The Rock said, hold my rock beer. I mean, did you see Young Rock? Did you see what a fever trip that was? I saw one short of that on YouTube, and that was all I needed to see. I was like, what in the fuck? And it's really, ironically, The Rock running for president. But, if he, yeah, exactly. But here's my question to you, Sky. Is it that much different than the amount of times that Vince inserted himself on television? Is it that and that's my pro and that And that is my problem, is that we just got rid of Vince, and now The Rock is doing the Vince shit. But I would argue a lot better and with a lot more box office drawing capability, which is... To, at, at but least you know Rocky can't resist the temptation to put the belt on himself. Honestly... Well, he came out with a belt that he made for himself. Well, he, he, Rocky two belts, Sean. Yes. Honestly... Oh listen, listen. I, I, my thing is that The Rock is going to get heat, and that's great and all, and I, I'm fine with it. But let Cody Rhodes or whoever keep the belt and don't let Rocky win. If if The Rock wins the WWE Championship, I'm going to be perfectly fine with it. It won't bother me at all. Even though he tried to do the exact same thing at 40? But, but he didn't. He changed course and Cody Rhodes got the moment that he was supposed to get. So I, Yeah, and then took all the credit for coming up with that idea. True. Oh, it was out of my brilliant brain that I had the foresight to go, well, what if I turned heel? Yeah, bullshit. You heard that crowd, they were like, oh, I guess I guess we can't do this, huh? No, you dumb idiot. Of course we can't. The, like, the Rock is the worst. Before. The Rock is the worst of Vince McMahon and Hulk Hogan put together. Again, I don't have the hate boner for The Rock. Uh, that Skyler has, that Sean used to have, but I, you said you don't hate him, but there's a little bit of animosity lingering from you, Sean. I mean, but, I mean, I, it, honestly, the fact that he put everything aside and allowed Cody his moment, I I was able to forgive him for a lot earlier this year. That's, the that's other it. The other stuff outside of WWE, like the government thing and the scamming stuff, 
That's one yeah. thing, but just within the confines of the show, I'm totally fine with The Rock doing whatever. Yeah. But again, Joshua, that's the point with the Logan Paul stuff, is that, like, because The Rock is a slimy heel piece of shit outside the ring, it makes him a great heel inside the ring. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, whether, I I like, whether I like The Rock or not, he's effective at his job. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think you're both correct in, in this situation. And, and kind of, I just want to emphasize something that you just said, Josh, again, that at the end of the day, the major difference, even though The Rock is doing the level of ego stuff as far as being on television and just showing up, winking, and leaving, and making who knows how much off of that two minutes that he showed up, Despite all of that, when it came to the most important thing on the night and in the company, Rock did the right thing. Uh-huh. That makes strides for a guy who downright refused for 20 years to do the right thing. Uh-huh. And that's that's the major difference. But I will say this. I don't want to see The Rock beat Cody either. I don't want it to be The Rock that beats Cody, but I also think that whoever beats The Rock for that belt, if that is the case, becomes a made guy instantly. So there, is, and, and at this point, I think Cody is kind of Teflon, you know, and I think that eventually there will be a heel turn associated with that. Maybe that's the catalyst of it in a similar way that it would have been for John Cena if, you know, Vince hadn't never wanted him to turn. But I think there's a possibility that The Rock beating Cody causes some sort of psychological downward spiral that leads to, you know, him feeling abandoned altogether by, you know, the people and the fans and how many people bitched about Cody's reign being boring, even though everyone was chanting his name for years. But, you know, even though I personally would much rather have Cody turn heel on him himself becoming an egomaniac. Uh, but, you know, kind of in the way that he was doing that social climbing thing with AEW where there was that lost potential there. But in, in lieu of that, I don't think The Rock is necessarily going to... I, I would say he's going to be kind of a, a neutral influence. There's going to be positive. There's going to be negative. I think they're going to balance each other out. Where Vince ended up being so overwhelmingly negative that you couldn't even give him credit for the positive. Whenever there was a positive, Vince often had to be dragged, kicking, and screaming into it. Oh, yeah, or away from it. Yeah. Yeah. And and so that's, that's the difference there. But I get what you're saying, Sky, because these are all valid concerns. They're all valid concerns, and we are going to see them play out, and I'm sure there's going to be moments that The Rock's ego is going to frustrate the hell out of us. I'm sure it's coming. I'm sure it's coming. But for what the overall end goal and of this company is now, I'm more willing to kind of let it roll because there's more trust that at the end of the day, the right thing's going to be done. That and the fact that because things are multi-layered, I mean, we didn't even talk about Kevin Owens attacking Cody Rhodes in the garage, which by the way, WWE themselves did not film it. They had fans film it to try and make it more organic, and hell, it worked. Yes, I I love how they shot that heel turn. Me too. Well, how Me they too. didn't shoot that heel turn. It made it feel so, like, spontaneous. Yeah, and it also makes it perfect for the unhinged level that Kevin Owens has kind of lacked lately that I think he's needed to reawaken in him, and this is a perfect opportunity for that. And not only are we, like, looking forward to, like, what what is The Rock back for? What is he going to say? Now we're like, what is Kevin Owens going to say on the next SmackDown? They're really, like, loading up, not just, not necessarily matches, they're loading up intrigue for SmackDown, and honestly, SmackDown kind of needs it. For sure. um, By the way, uh, (laughs) Joshua... Uh, I'm reading some of the spoilers for Raw. Oh, no. <laughs> Braun Breaker's a heel. Oh, no. <laughs> well, because he spears the ever-loving shit out of Jey Uso, Xavier Woods, and Kofi Kingston and holds the IC title up. Oh, Lord. That I, sounds I, like a baby face to me, but... Uh, well, well him, him spearing Xavier Woods is pure baby face energy, but... Uh, I can't wait to watch a two-hour Raw. That, that Two-hour Raw sounds so good. 
it, it's going to be shorter than this show, I'll tell you that. Yeah. And while we're co coasting towards three hours, let's get to the ratings here. As Can I go first because I want to go eat dinner? <laughs> yes. No, you, just for that, you're going last. <laughs> go ahead, Josh, you get him. Um, I Take thought... as much time as you need. I thought that... Okay. <laughs> I thought this was a very good show. There were some issues that I had here and there, some things that I didn't agree with, uh, like match positioning, although I very much understand and emphasize... Well, not emphasize, but empathize, empathize words. I'm tired. Um, I was going emphasize to... Emphasize your empathy. Yes. I was, I was originally going to give this show like a 6 out of 10, but I decided while we were talking about it, and the more like I understand why they did what they did, I'm bumping it up to a 7. Although the absolute match of the night and match of the year contender was the Hell in a Cell match. Mazel Tov to CM Punk and Drew McIntyre. That was a work of art. Um, and Bailey and Nia was surprisingly good. Finn and Damien was, was pretty good, although the main thing I cared about was Dragon Ball. Uh, the women's shark cage match was fine. And the main event was really good, and it builds a lot of entry going into SmackDown. So yeah, I'm giving Bad Blood a solid 7 out of 10. Yeah, and as far as I'm concerned, I'm actually going to pray. I might be the highest one of the bunch, and not just because of the pens I've been hitting. But I, I, <laughs> I do believe that this show, all in all, delivered at a level that I was hoping. I, I mean, I also skipped a lot of like the entrances and stuff like that when I went back to rewatch it. So I kind of got to the meat of the matter mm -hmm. in a lot of the case, you know, in, in that respect. But at the same point, you know, the women's matches didn't have to do, or at least the first one didn't have to deliver the way it did. Um, I think that they, I just, the biggest takeaway I have from this is that this show could have used one more match. Yeah. Just to balance things out and then not force the Hell in a Cell to be first. But that overall, I mean, they had their little bumps and bugs and, and you know, kind of show quirks <laughs> that happened along the way. But like you said, Josh, again, for a B pay per view that is supposed to move things along and keep things interesting as they head towards this time of transition between networks, I, I thought this was pretty good. I'm going to actually go one, one small step higher than Josh again and give this a seven and a half because nothing on this show was bad. And there was some, and the things that were bad were so bad that they were insanely funny. So, overall, a good night. Skyler. Well, I'm officially in trouble with my mom, so you're not going to get my review. Sorry. Bye. No, um, <laughs> no, she, she's legitimately pissed, man. I'm in trouble. I got bad blood with my mom now. Uh, <laughs> Skyler versus Skyler's mom, hell in a cell. No, it's just. It is what it is with The Rock. I just, I hope that this doesn't, you know, get self-centered, but it is what it is. I did enjoy the show. Despite my gripes, I'll also give it a 6 out of 10. Now I apologize, guys, but I'm done. Later. Well, bye, Skyler. We're all done. Yes. We're all done. We're baked. We're toast. We're cooked. And Skyler needs to grow a pair. And with that said, thank you all for coming to the Court Martial Podcast. As Josh again and I close out this wonderful podcast for wonderful people, as a reminder to be wonderful yourselves, Mr. Wonderful, Paul Orndorff. Be that without the dystrophy. We'll see you next time. Jesus Christ. I don't even know. How, soon? I, I don't even know what to say to that. I'm glad you guys enjoyed the podcast. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> 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 bye, fuck you, bye.